you know what? I would think he and shut up, Croc. I'm beginning. Hello. Here's the opening of the show. We're starting a little bit early here. Clickety clack, clickety clack, light bulbs, uh, things careening by, uh, typewriters, and if, uh, you've ever all seen typewriters? No, you haven't. You're all young, hopefully. And clickety clack, analog clocks. There we go. One of these days, I'll have sound I to do. go with this thing. Uh, Troubles in Paradise, TortukanWordPress.com. For heaven's sakes, get to my little WordPress uh, website, put it on your list, uh, share everything, and so forth and so on. Uh, so anyway, here's the uh, show today. We got a bunch of little guests. We had a little guest earlier, and then that disappeared. Uh, there, are, uh, C Brown has been writing a bunch of uh, snarks at me on the, the various videos over the last few weeks that I've been doing here. Uh, he even bought Rupee and Sanford's book as a result. He's a diehard creationist, and I seem to have recalled seeing him in other contexts. So when I finally saw him on the uh, uh, feed, I, he wanted to be on the show. I've also given a, a message to Nephilim Free, uh, whether or not he uh, shows up or not. Uh, C, as usual, did not like to b play fair in that it's my show and I want to ask him questions and I want him to answer those questions, not run off on his little diatribes. But he said, oh, I can't do that. And so he bugged out on his own. I did not eject him. But he was in the room and, and uh, you can all bear witness to the fact that he was there and up to his usual little antics. Uh, I, I explicitly wanted to discuss the reptile mammal transition jaw issue because that's an area that I know intimately about because I wrote the damn book on it. And so I would be curious to have known what his understanding of the issue was and how he was going to deal with the data. Not that he was likely to get to that, but he would have to answer questions. So uh, if Nephilim shows up, we'll be able to get back to it. I put a bunch of links in the uh, thing as well to a bunch of technical papers that relate to the genetics and developmental biology of the jaw issue that people can look through to find out. We know a hell of a lot about this subject. But we'll probably be sticking because we've got a bunch of people here who this is more their area of expertise. Uh, we'll be going into the exciting world of contested bones. Rupi and Sanford's uh, creationist book that was sent to me by a frustrated secularist who said, I don't have time to go through this. Would you mind going through it uh, with your source methods approach? And I go, sure. So I couldn't afford to get it, but he bought it for me and had it shipped out to me. And I've been going through it unit by unit, uh, source by source. Uh, the book... Uh, immediately, the, the, from a source methods thing, because there were about 20 some episodes in, I will remind everybody that source methods involves looking at how people build arguments. And my contention is, is that people who have their head up their ass, cranial blockage of the rectum, if you prefer, um, have really bad method and creationists are that way. And you can see this at the source methods level. The first thing I spotted right off the bat, there's no bloody index in the book. There's no uh, bibliography reference. So if you want to find out what it's sourced, You'd have to manually compile a list. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. So I'm compiling a reference bibliography for it. I'm checking out and looking up the sources and documenting things. And week over week, I've been finding where they're misrepresenting the sources. I catalog, catalog them in my spreadsheet as to whether or not they're a technical source or a general source. Um, and uh, a big chunk, about 40% of it, are um, what I would call secondary sources, uh, newspaper articles, magazine things, commentaries on technical works and so forth, uh, books that have been done by the writers over the years. Uh, so about a, a third of it is actual technical work. Of that, about a third of the technical papers they've cited, they've misrepresented the contents by directly making statements from them that aren't in there or uh, by so suppressing the content of them that they disqualify as a fair representation. And then a big chunk of the remainder are ones that are non-controversial, the equivalent of saying that a fossil existed and it existed at a particular time. Nobody's arguing that, so let's move on. Uh, none of their work actually can be deemed as supporting their creationist position. So I don't, uh, even though I could theoretically have a column for colored for that, category. There hasn't been any yet, and I'm not expecting it on it. Uh, so uh, what I've done here, uh, normally I like to have primary source material that everybody can uh, uh, follow up on directly. It turns out a couple of the papers for today's ones weren't directly accessible online, but I am putting up the reference. But I will go into my exciting world of screen share so that everyone can see the little juicy nugget that I managed to come up with here. And let's put this thing up on full screen. See the screen here. Uh, this was from Randall Sussman, 1983 article on um, the evolution of the human foot evidence from plyopleistocene hominids from the 
Foot and Ankle Journal, which is a relatively minor, literally it was the first article I'd ever encountered from that journal. Um, and I was able to get the full text of it by surreptitious means. And so I have put in something they did not quote. And uh, all um, uh, Rupi, who is the point man for the researcher, all he wanted to put up was just a, an oblique reference to some particular bones in that, uh, but he did not quote this, and I will read it for you. In sum, the Hadar foot remains reveal a combination of primitive hominoid and advanced hominoid traits. These features in combination not only present a unique total morphological pattern, but they portray an animal that engaged in their italics, both arboreal climbing and terrestrial bipedal locomotion. If we view the overall morphology of Australopithecus afarensis from Hadar, including the hip, knee, shoulder, elbow, and hand, all of which are adequately represented for such interpretation, see reference 20 we have what can be clearly seen as a structural missing link between apes and later hominids. Whoa, that is the opposite mm. of what Rupi and Sanford are implying, that Sussman's position is that the Australopithecines were purely arboreal, they had only occasional bipedality, they were not real bipeds. No, that's the opposite of their position. And by the way, that note 47 refers to Jack Stern and Randall Sussman's 1983 paper, which Rupi cited a lot and clearly misunderstood the content of it since the author, co-author of the paper pointedly references it as confirming this bipedal element. And then the other one, which you can actually get full link, I put in a full uh, a linkage to it, is uh, uh, Don Johansson's 1982 paper. Uh, that was the reference number 25 in the Sussman article. What was intriguing about it is that this particular April 1982 issue, there was literally the article just before that in the journal, another of Johansson's article that was just generally on their various finds, but wasn't specifically about the AL-288 uh, fossil, that Rupi repeatedly cited, and somehow he managed to miss Johansson's paper that was the specific details, that was the stuff that his own cited source of Sussman had listed as an important work to look at, yeah. see reference 25. Oh Wait. gosh, this is bad scholarship. Uh, so RJ, you're telling me that a creationist is not being honest? I, I, I am so shocked. shocked. I'm shocked. It's utterly un unbelievable on this point, but it's par for the course. And what should have been pretty obvious from this over and over and over again uh, is that this is a monotonous pattern of behavior. Rupi and Sanford have a dogma that human beings are one thing and the late holy prints were made by by human beings walking around under what circumstances they don't seem to tell these are things that were laid down in an ash fall which is kind of hard to do underwater glub 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 was this during the flood or not i don't know they yeah. haven't quite worked that out uh but that uh, australopithecines and lucy it was not a biped according to the creationist dogma in the book and therefore no evidence can be allowed to contradict that the problem is is their sources contradict that the very technical papers they are alluding to again and again and again were explicitly saying the opposite of what they were doing. And last week's episode, I was pointing out how the Laetoli prints are not fully human. If you put up a print of a chimpanzee foot and chimpanzee uh, footprints and you look up at a human footprint and human prints uh, and uh, Laetoli prints and an Australopithecine foot, they look way more human than the chimpanzee does, but that doesn't mean they're fully human. And once again, they were constantly overlooking evidence that contradicted their viewpoint on that. Any comments from uh, a, a, a frustrated atheist? Would you have some observations? Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, this is, a, and like Cap said, incredibly shocking that they are misrepresenting things. This. This doesn't sound like creationists. They, I mean, they tell nothing but the absolute truth. Absolutely. Yeah. Because and they, that's why I, I strongly recommend it. Croc, uh, Crocus Squirrel, do you have something to say? I can say, if you're shocked, then you're the only one. <laughs> this is the behavior I absolutely expected from Ropey and Sanford. But you've yeah. got to realize that, you know, the, the, the length of the leg, the, uh, the, the, the straightness of knee, you know, arch support, all that sort of noise. It all goes into the human gate, the 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 gate of the uh the, of our branch of the great apes. Because yes, yeah. folks, if you can if you understand what I'm saying, you are a freaking ape. I, I, earlier here, I will point out that C. Brown, who is a young Earth creationist who has been 
uh, sailing this series, was in the room earlier, just before we were getting started, and he bugged out on his own. Why? Because we were having ground rules for how the conversation was going to go. And uh, all, those in the conversation can attest to the fact that he was trying to argue that, well, chimpanzees can walk for a little bit upright, which is perfectly true. We know this. This is not a news bulletin. But it is also the fact that their gait and their foot distribution, weight distribution patterns, all of that differ substantially, not only from humans, they also differ from Australopithecines and the Laetoli prints. So we've got a long track record of the technical literature of here, working out the dynamics of how feet operate, how weight is distributed between a bipedal gait and a partially bipedal gait and a gait where you're walking with the knees uh, bent as opposed to one that's straight up the way humans do fully and all of that. And you can tell that from the pressure if patterns and stuff. Yeah. If I may, yeah. most, chimp most chimpanzees, and in fact, gorillas as well, they actually have a, uh, they have a, a, a gap in, the hand, in each hand that allows them to put their knuckles down on the ground and use those. Yeah, yeah. Which, does, which is an adaptive trait, well, well, and it's well, not found in any of the Australopithecines. Yeah. But that's where I was going with that. It's not found in the Australopithecines. In the Australopithecines, it wasn't found in the Artipithecines. It was not, and it is not found in any edition of Homo. Mm -hmm. That is a strictly humanoid trait. Yeah, yeah. Or a and what's fascinating about it is all of the bits about what little bits and pieces have come along to where they can work out about how the bone structures are working, how the limb proportions are, how the pelvic structures are. It's all a gigantic, uh, interconnected jigsaw puzzle that has a mass of technical literature. And one nice side effect of plowing through Rupi and Stanford's stupid little book is that I've learned a lot of new technical papers that I wasn't aware of, particularly of the older material from the 70s and 80s. And oh boy, are Rupi prone to scavenging stuff from the 70s and 80s that I hadn't really bothered too much about on, on some of these earlier finds because I had the more recent technical literature. So I filled a lot of that in, but I've also determined how badly they are at the uh, uh, site source citation, one of the ones, one of the Johansson articles that uh, Rupi cited just um, uh, that I noted a couple weeks ago, when I tracked down a direct quote that they were claiming from Rupi uh, in their book that turned out not to be in the article at all, zip, it wasn't there. So where they got this alleged direct quotation from, it wasn't from the source they cited. Uh, there's a, a, a tremendous sloppiness on the part of their research. They, they're, they're very typical in that respect. Samford is the secondary party here. He, by his own admission, says basically Rupert is, Rupi is doing all the technical work. He's doing all the research. And boy, that's a mistake <laughs> uh, because this guy's a terrible researcher. And you can spot yeah. that at the source methods direction. Jump in. Uh, I was just going to say, since you were talking about and you were grading them on the source methods approach, let me guess, they don't even get a D minus. Uh, they, yeah, they, they, they fail. Uh, because the, the one thing that you learn in, in rigorous analysis is you play fair with all your data and you play fair with all your sources. If you want to make an argument, fine and dandy, but you don't dare put a quotation up uh, uh, directly citing a particular work and it's not in there. Or you do not overlook conveniently enough any argument and information in the primary sources that you've cited that calls into question your own argument. You you bring them up, you deal with them, you make a counter argument, find it dandy if you can do that, but you don't pretend they're not there. And repeatedly, pathologically, there is deck stacking of their argument and authority quoting just to make their little teeny narrow points and never tell the reader the external data field so that they can make up uh, uh, their own minds yeah. on this. Now, whether Rupi is close enough to this, he may have just well, been a pure secondary source. Well, the thing is, is you've also got to realize that these books are mainly for their uh, creationist audience who oh, yeah. don't actually fact check anybody and they just take an authority's word um, as gold. Yeah, yeah. So the secondary this, this isn't addiction. some. You can make up just about anything and everything you want to. Yeah. As long as it sounds good and it fits your narrative, then the uh, audience will be fine and dandy with it. Yeah. Well, if you look that back in these previous why videos, do that. Why would people hmm? do that? That's kind of just that. That's even more retarded than freaking. That's as retarded as Ken Hovind. I'm sorry. It's it's uh, well. It's well if you think well, about it, it's just like. Attitude. If you think about it, it's just like the um, it's just like the um, 
whole entire archaeology of like say for instance uh, a whale there's a well that you know no one uh, could know if it was from Nazareth and they or they thought that this area might be Nazareth and they said looked at this well and secular sources looked inside the well and found no coins and kept going well then the creationists come up right behind them fought, supposedly found coins that dated it to uh, the time frame of uh, of the Bible and it's like okay well where are the coins oh well we can't show you that mm. oh well, we can't show you anything yeah, there's an awful lot of the. It's the ones. that's like the guy that f supposedly found a, a Wyatt or whatever his name was that supposedly found the uh, Exodus uh, chariot wheels down in the bottom of the Red yeah. Sea and all of that. You know, but, is that but Wyatt? Well, as soon as you start investigating these things, this is all Eric von Daniken class uh, a pseudo scholarship yeah. at that level. Um, I, I was going to say something that Animal Man uh, pointed out in the chat. Then I have something to say that Crook Square as well. I don't know if you saw. He said it to both me and you. Mm -hmm. RJ about knuckle walking isn't exclusive to AC. There, most knuckle walkers had long claws, like the I'm not even going to try and pronounce that one. Oh, the like theories. Yeah. And um, ant eaters. So yeah, I just I don't know much on that. I don't know if you guys did, but you know, Squirrel on the Jackson Reed probably would have been at Thumbland. I think he's looked into yeah. some of this uh, area as well. Okay. Yeah, there's it, it, the one thing. This goes way back as a general principle, all the way back to Baron Cuvier, who was not an evolutionist, who lived around the same time as Napoleon. And it's that animals aren't put together magic-y. There's a, a sense to how they are constructed. They've got, to, that's why design advocates can uh, go a little ways on the fact that you have animal adaptations connect up to things. And you can see the dynamics of them. Nowadays, of course, 21st century. And so we can look more about the, the developmental biology of the muscle systems and the adaptive characteristics and how what eventually what genes are mutating to produce these kinds of things to see all the nuts and bolts of that, which, uh, had C stuck it out, uh, I would have wanted to have explored it in relation to the reptile mammal transition stuff. Yeah. But boy, it, uh, is it correct to describe his reaction as a hissy fit? I missed it, so I don't know. Well, the other the other ones were well, here. When, when I would I would go because I was trying to explain to him. Yeah, yeah, I I was trying to explain to him that you know you can. Um, that you can finish what you're trying to say right now, but mm. after that, I was going to address it, and he didn't no. even let me say that. He, all he heard was me saying, I'll address this uh, to you, and then all of a sudden, he's just like, you know what? No, I'm not going to do this. Click. Yeah, you know, he, he's, yeah. he's behaved this way before. He, he, I, he's appeared, I can't remember what his moniker was on the... Um, uh, uh, Steve McRae's uh, shows that he's been on, but I, I recognize that and his style. And he's just very uh, hot to trot uh, out his talking points. He's terrible at answering specific questions on specific points, which is why I wanted to keep him pinned down on something, uh, which was the jaw transition, because I really genuinely, I told him before the show started up, I genuinely wanted to know what he thought he knew about our jaw evolution and uh, what the data is, because I know what creationists have written on the subject, and it's diddly. And so he would have had to have done some independent research on this point, and so I was wanting to find pick his brain on that. And if Nephilim shows up, I'll pick his brain on this as well, because I'm intrigued to know what's going on inside of it. But, but instead, he went hissy fit, and uh, I warned him, excuse me, this is my show, and uh, I have the power to mute you or, or boot you, but I didn't, we didn't even boo, do a boot cap. Uh, there, he left on his own. <laughs> he, he, he boot cap. Squirrel, you're, you're, you're breaking you're off. in and out there. You're, oh. you're being teleported. Ah, well. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, so any any overall uh, comments? We, we started a little bit early on this, and I was hoping, frankly, to have a little bit more opportunity to actually have a chit-chat with C. Brown, if he could um, uh, have yeah, stayed I, functional. Oh, yeah, I was going to say and one I thing. And I will to say, if he's if he's here in the uh, chat real quick, you're more than welcome to come back because, like yeah, I said, all I was he, trying to do, all I was trying to do, back. yeah, all I was trying to do was uh, say that after you were done speaking, I was going to address your comment yeah. or your question. Yeah, anybody who's that thin-skinned uh, and prone to this sort of thing. Um, uh, uh, 
what I determine from the lengthy exchanges, and if you go back through the videos, you can see I don't delete any of, of his crap. Uh, he puts his stuff up and I make my comments and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And it was plainly clear from my end that he, uh, his idea of research is basically scavenging around and repeating what he's found in the creationist literature. And he'll cite a technical paper, but it's one he got from a creationist source. And he would lob material that he gleaned from Rupi and Sanford. And, and I'm, I'm going, excuse me, but this is the whole issue, a question. Are Rupi and Sanford reliable reporters? And this is no. questionable. And I could never get C to ever acknowledge that Rupi had ever made a mistake on anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and boy, did he, if they made mistakes up the yin yang on things. Um, I'm going through their book uh, bit by bit uh, and assembling all of that source material. They've also, it's sparsely documented. Uh, at the moment, they're running about a, a little over 200 sources, and there's a lot of repetition to some of them, and this is on page 100 and some odd. So they're only running about two sources per page. Now, for Slam Dunk, I had 2,300 sources for a 400-page text. So Which that's really above five sources per page. And uh, even in some of these areas, I felt I was just scratching the surface. So it's a light row to hoe. Yeah. Um. And someone was going to tell Square earlier on something that was said, but I don't remember what it was. Oh, when somebody here, uh, keep an eye on the, um, uh, I see a, a BJ and Psy Strike and a few other people, Animal Man, they're all in there. Keep an eye on the live feed just in case I get going on my little shtick. Uh, and uh, and uh, Brownie, you were talking about Ant Man's uh, whole entire thing about the uh, bipedalism. It, no, that was one that was a comment that I saw that was interesting because I'm not familiar with the anteaters or the other one that was mentioned. Um, but no, it was no, it was about the uh, taking a, things on authority. Where Squirrel saying that dumb, but that's straight up what religion is. I mean, you have to take it from the man behind the pulpit. Oh, I mean, he speaks the, the, directly to God. What is the Bible but the ultimate secondary source? Yeah. And so uh, once you have a mind that can easily mm -hmm. conflate primary and secondary sources, that can read yeah. a secondary account and you decide, well, that's true without ever fact checking it. I'm trying to prod more people into using that source method. We know Pologia has made use of that, Jackson Wheat and all that. I kind of up the ante yeah. for them to, to raise them up to even a higher level. And I tell you, it's a no lose situation because whenever you source check things, you learn more and you're measuring the reliability of your secondary source. And you yeah. may discover to your chagrin that somebody you had been following as a secondary source actually has their head up their ass and you maybe not want to follow them anymore, even if they do yeah. occasionally things that are accurate. Other times you'll be getting that ring of truth. There are people, uh, 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 Carl Zimmer would be an example of a secondary analyst, he, but he does just crackerjack brilliant stuff. Uh, Brian Nash is another one. They're just meticulous and careful and, and informative. And you can tell people like that over years and years and years, because when you track down the source material, which I urge people to do, you find out more and more and more of the uh, primary source material. Uh, I, I know that nobody can be anal retentive on everything, but what you should have is everybody will have some area of interest that they really are going to study no matter what. They don't need to be prodded. So in those cases, you want to dive into the primary sources. Is somebody running laundry? That's me. Oh, well, hey, yeah, you're having, are they now building the road outside? <laughs> no, I'm driving now. Oh, okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah. All right, it, it, it's not a good idea to be driving and trying to do audio thingies, though. That's, uh, unless you've got like a button on your, on your, uh, your I... I do that. What I'm doing is I have uh, my headset in and I am just watching the road and paying attention. Okay, good. Yes, you I've want to stay guys. observant at yeah. all times. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, those of those. It's actually against the law in Washington State to do cell phoning and stuff. Uh, you can get pulled over in a ticket on it, and uh, uh, people are discovering all even, of that. It's even it's with not only impolite; it's dangerous. <laughs> Even with a hands-free device, RJ? Uh, well, no, with a hands-free device, that's okay. a separate thing. But there will okay. be people that will actually be trying to get that, that thing up to their bid like that. Yeah. And, uh, oh, you can, I think it's like a three or $400 ticket. I mean, it's a oh, yeah. heavy. It's, uh, well, it is um, here. In and, other places, yeah. it's not as much. In some places, it's a lot more. Try Los yeah. Angeles sometime. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I, I, I try to uh, avoid Los Angeles. I think the last time I've driven in Los Angeles was back in the 1980s. 
So I, I don't have any experience of it since then. Right. If I'm not, if, if memory serves, the the ticket for the thousand dollars. Mm. Woo, wow, that is pricey. Oh, yeah. Here uh, what, I'll, like what I'll do oh. um, on the, since C. Brown was not here um, uh, to be able to discuss this subject, I'll give the little preface of what I would have been curious about because um, I've, I've described it before, but we'll give it again for the, the whack of things. It's really easy to tell a reptile jaw from a mammal jaw. If you're wandering around a, uh, um, uh, a museum anytime, you want to spot the mammal, uh, it's not a difficult one to do. You're looking for the very thing that we have, which is from the dentary bone, there's this damn coronoid process that sticks up. It's really flanged. So the typical cross section of a mammal jaw looks like a big L laid on its side. Yeah. And it's that coronoid process where the muscle attachment is that joins it to the squamosal up in the uh, jaw. So you can tell a mammal from non-mammal really fast. Now, when you get far enough back in the reptile mammal transition thing, like looking at Dimetrodon, you have something that's still laid out like a reptile. And that's why they're hard to, to tell the difference between various archosaurs and dinosaurs and all the rest, unless you're more of a professional. But a full, well-developed mammal is quite a different kettle of fish. Uh, oh, uh, Animal Man says they went to L.A. once and visited the La Brea Tar Pit. I think they've had a much bigger museum built in there since I last was in there, which was back in the 1980s. Uh, and it's a, a delightful one. They still do an awful lot of fascinating paleontology on the site. I think an awful lot of the specimens are still just beginning to analyze them all. And of course, they have much more analytical techniques than they did when uh, we were even looking in the 1980s. They can look more at the genetics, all of that. So it, it, it's ongoing science stuff down there and smells to high heaven because it's a bloody tar pit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be cool to go see. I mean, just to actually visit it. Because yeah, I don't right down the middle of town. It, but. It's um, actually kind of meh. Oh, okay. I, I mean, I've always heard about it and people talk about it. And I just, it's one of those like, oh, everybody talks about it. Well, let's put it on my to-do list sometime, maybe. Yeah. It's about the size of a, um, a small suburban park. Uh, and it's just plopped down right in the middle of the city. Uh, so I don't even know whether or not they've got easy parking and space to get to it because again, it's like been 30 years since I've been down there. So my memory is, is uh, not super duper fresh. They had a, a fairly new modest museum there, but I think they've done an awful lot more, uh, on it in the decades since. So anybody that's watching the show or whatever that wants to weigh in on their experiences of the Liberia tar pits, fill them in because it should be really quite neat. Uh, uh, and it's some fascinating science on that. Anyway. So RJ, I was gonna ask, since you're talking about your memory going, uh, let me guess you can feel it going. I can feel it going, Dave. <laughs> Do you want me to sing Daisy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just I think we can we spare do, everybody that. Now the other yeah, factor is that. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. Um, the other factor that I was gonna point out about the reptile mammal jaw transition. Uh, is the fact that the developmental biology part, and um, since C is not here to ask. Uh, we wouldn't be able to get his answer on it. But uh, the fact of the matter is that it's been known since the 1830s that if you look at a mammal jaw in the embryo, it isn't the mammal layout. It's the standard reptile vertebrate layout, which is there's a dentary bone and then there's a bunch of other little bones and then there's an articular at the far end. And the articular is the, the uh, jaw hinge that goes up to the quadrate bone in the skull. That's the standard vertebrate layout. And that's the one that reptiles end up with uh, as uh, adult uh, lizards. But the mammal starts out in that layout, and I'm, I'm thinking that he was going to go off on the homology thing to, to suggest that was just yeah. a coincidence. Which yeah, is a which would be – here, here's my thing. Okay, I, I would love for him to be on here because I'm going to assume yeah. he's going to claim everybody, or everybody and everything is designed by God. If that mm -hmm. is the case, why the hell would he do that? That makes no why sense from any design perspective. Why isn't the mammal embryo starting out in the mammal jaw layout from the get-go? Exactly. Rather than exactly. have this exactly. other stage. That one? Hmm? Yes. Because Take it that was one. derived from reptiles. Yeah, um, duh. Yeah. And here's where things get fun. Because then I would have wanted to discuss those probanic methods that I've been banging at him on and all anti-evolutionists on, uh, on, because they are the transitional form between the two. And the fun part is, if he is a credulous little creationist, where is he going to get his information from? How easy is it 
for him to get the skivvy. Because as it turns out, there's really little in the creationist online literature to help him. He can't find much from Dwayne Gish. Gish's main discussion of the subject, which I went into in Slam Dunk, and by the way, everybody out there that doesn't have Evolution Slam Dunk, damn it, why not? But it's a great book. And by the way, I need the royalties. So it's, a, uh, it's because okay. I'm broke, folk. RJ. Yes. Brian Steven has a really fun little question in, in, in the oh. chat here. Why do we need why do we need to even be born if God could create us out of dirt? Yeah, yeah, why can't he have zots? Why do we go through this reproduction process at all? There's a whole bunch of issues that that are why are thing why are we made of matter as opposed to something else? Why do we made made of hadrons and leptons? Why do we have carbon? Oh, I, uh, you know, I, know, I know, I know, I know. Mm -hmm. I know because he has to punish us for the sin in the garden. Remember, he said he was going to make you know childbearing even more painful. I mean, yeah, yeah. There we go. That explains it. How did, that go from, how did we go from not happening to even more painful? Yeah. Well, there <laughs> we go. That's that weird story uh, that that, that uh, you get in these things. That that anybody that reads the Bible and, and doesn't come away with it going, "Whoa, okay, this needs a script editor." Uh, has, has kind of missed out on things. But anyway, back to the reptile mammal transition. Um, so what we've got is the interesting question, how can you go from a system that has a bunch of dentary, of dentary and other jaw bones that are hinged on one bone in the skull to a system with a single dentary bone that's hinged on a completely different bone in the skull? We can see an element of the process because in our embryology, as the dentary bone expands, eventually when that edge of the dentary hits the skull where the squamosal bone is, um, then bingo, uh, the remaining bones are pulled up <laughs> into the middle ear. And so they've known that development. You, you were laughing there, Lord? Yeah, side strikes I, and stuff. Like yeah. That. Humans come from dirt. Why is there still dirt? Why is there still dirt? How do you know there is dirt? So I complain that there, we have no evidence that there's actually dirt. It's only homologous to dirt. Uh, Sai, I do have to correct you on something. There are no transitional forms, said every creationist ever. I actually was about floored today because in one of the more recent uh, Answers News, and I know I gave it to I gave the link to RJ, they, uh, they were talking about transitional forms. I'm Brandon, waiting they were trying to, to talk about we'll talk about cosmology again because yeah. that shit needs to be addressed. And yeah. I know his cosmology is nine kinds of squirrel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are, there are squirrels out there going, "Damn!" Are all of us guy, are all of us kind of sad that C left the show? Because I think this would have been I noisy but interesting. I, I would lied. have loved him to be on here. So. I could yeah. have taught well, him something about Oslo. Yeah, Prophecy. see, and remember, C. Brown, you left the show of your own hissy fit, not because I lobbed you out, but only because you wanted to command the stage like some Trumpist ego maniac, rather than have a discussion. When you are a guest on another person's show, you apparently can't submerge your superior mind. By the way, he in his discussions, he was constantly lording it over about how fabulously accurate and everything his viewpoint of things is. And, and I was constantly prodding him. Huh. You need to contact these scientists and tell them how brilliant you are. You are way ahead of them. You know their field so much better than they do. <laughs> let's let's <laughs> tell us about this. Well, tell us how their reaction is. Are you know what I would have said? Then, sir, where is your Nobel Prize? Yeah, exactly. And how is it you know so much about, uh, and how is it that you know so much about so many fields when your every scientist has to work ha has to work? Yeah. Twenty Never mind that he couldn't always spell correctly. Sometimes he was doing it to get enough of understanding to realize he's an idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so my Tortukan alert was flashing a lot on him. But anyway, on this jaw matter, what was interesting is uh, the fact that how can you get from a system that uses an articulate quadrate jaw hinge to one that is using a dentary squamosal and it needs to be functional all the way through. That's one of the things that of course creationists have big problems with when they're talking about, oh, the fossil record should be littered with all of these mutant non-functional animals. How can that exist? No, no, no. Evolution is exactly the opposite. It's gotta be functional oh. all the way down. Yeah. But I've got a serious problem with yeah. the fact that they I got a serious problem with the fact that they think that that the fossil record should be littered with anything for the fact that it is extremely, extremely 
rare to even get a fossil. Yeah. And they want the process yeah. to be for every individual little thing whenever billions the process just for of, one. Of yeah. And, and, and also, just for the process for one is incredibly rare. Well, the reason yeah. why we have such a crappy rep record for chimpanzees, for example, is they live in an environment that disintegrates bones. So there's yeah. a terrible fossil record for them. If you happen to live in an environment where another factor is just the, uh, I call this the Bermuda Triangle defense in the, in the tip work where uh, people will say, well, there are all these missing links and transitional things that are missing and these fossil bones that are missing. Why is it that? Well, maybe because there was like the rock disappeared. Uh, that uh, is it any coincidence that there's a relatively sparse fossil record for early Triassic marine uh, animals because there's almost no early Triassic rocks to look in? Plate subduction mm -hmm. has devoured the oceans. So, you know, you're, you're going to, you, you, you could have up the land deposits up the yin yang, but that's not doing you a damn bit of good to tell what's going on in the sea. So, you have what basically you have to hope that a chunk of land that used to be at the bottom of the ocean and the animal died and ended down and was fortuitously buried enough that that land gets eventually pushed up into the surface and eroded away to the point where you can get at it. And in some cases, like Motani, the uh, guy that hunts up ichthyosaurs, he's had to climb up the sides of island mountains to find the damn rocks that are up there on there, these rare examples of Triassic deposits. But even there, the fossil genie just seems dedicated to making stuff to make evolutionists happy because he keeps on creating these little things in just the right spots, including those probanic nathans. So, so how many of uh, the, 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 the thing that I want to make really popular where, where dinosaurs get pushed aside in the debate compared to the reptile mammal transition, those non-sexy therapsids that look like mice. Uh, we want to get them onto the field because they are the killer app. Because in 1912, it's one of the gobsmacking examples of rational reasoning of anybody because he looked through, okay, you got this reptile jaw hinge and we know what the mammal jaw hinge does. How can you get from one to the other and be functional? You can't have the jaw hinges just switching to where suddenly the dentary bone is now attached to uh, uh, the, the quadrate. And then what happened to the other bone attachment or did it jump to do, no, 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 no. There's only one way this is gonna work functionally. That you have to have an animal with an articular quadrate reptile hinge. And then there had to be a completely new form of life that had an additional secondary jaw hinge, a double jaw hinge next to it from the dentary to the squamosal bone. While the other one was still functional and yeah. There's no life form that does that in living animals. But you know, to do that, you gotta do something more. You've gotta morph the skull around so that the dentary bone attachment is next to the articular. So the articular has to have been nested inside of this expanding dentary bone. And at the same time, the skull has to morph around so that the uh, uh, squamosal bone has to be right now next to where the quadrate is. So when this new hinge is formed with this additional musculature, uh, it's pulling in the same direction as the articular quadrate. So you, and you can tell by the way, muscle attachments because they produce little striations, little, little scrape marks on the bones. And so there's a whole bunch of this stuff. So he is predicting a completely unknown form of life that nobody ever knew about that doesn't exist in nature in alive today. And that had to have existed as the one and only necessary way to get from a reptile jaw hinge to a mammal jaw hinge. And the fossil genie, AKA God, apparently heard Robert Broom's plea 250 million years ago or 4,500 years ago, depending upon which chronology you use, mm -hmm. and made sure that exactly those forms were created in the fossil record with diothignathus and probenignathus and all the rest of the things. Oh, I know, I right? Don't, I don't think you're that's You're just really a non-believing sinner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're just a non-believing sinner on that. So that, and that's what the delicious part is. And and we we even it helps explain something else too, is before the the double jaw formed, and before the extra uh, uh, redundant hinge was uh, uh, changed, so that the dentary uh, squamosal becomes the dominant one, and the other one becomes redundant. The dentary bone was expanding before this. Why was it expanding before this? It's because of what the animals ate. It turns out because they were insectivores and insectivores had this selection pressure 
that a longer, narrow dentary arcade, I even explained this to uh, a creationist that uh, Mike Riddle uh, on uh, Jackson Wheat and I discussion uh, a couple a week or so ago, where he was just totally clueless on this. And I knew he was going to be totally clueless on this because he knows nothing at all about any of the fossil data. He's just a credulous creationist. But we now know about that there's a dynamic form that those long, thin dentary bones smushing down on insects the very act of those little curved teeth going down pulls the bug into the mouth. So there is a selection pressure adaptively for long, narrow dentary arcades. And those are uniquely, they don't require a big, strong jaw. They, they require only very, very little thing uh, for that. And then later on, as this now expanded dentary had pushed back to where it was already in the position to start the next step of the process, which was the formation of the second jaw hinge, where God apparently really wanted there to be evidence for evolution, so he went out of his way to create these things. Yeah. So shouldn't probanognathids be stars? They look like little mice. No, no, uh, but RJ, RJ, I haven't figured it out. I, I figured it out finally. It, it wasn't God doing that. It's because, remember, he made humans last. That was the very last thing. Mm -hmm. So he made all the reptiles first on day whatever, and, and then he, then he kind of made some mammals, and he's like, and then he made the other ones that you were mentioning with the double hinge. And he's like, you know, I like this part of this jaw for this next set and then created mammals. And then from there, he created humans with the jaw we have. So, so yeah, that's and how all he did of this, it. by the way, was on day one or two or three <laughs> or four. It was over the course of a week. God yeah. had a very imagination and he, and he slipped in all these little dinosaurs and that's by the way one of the problems that young earth creationism has which is they have not one bottleneck but two everybody focuses on that flood bottleneck where everything alive today had to have been on board the ark and therefore yeah. how many ark kinds were there but there's actually a second bottleneck that i've been alluding to which is the original creation arc uh, creation kind listing every single fossil that they attribute to the flood had to have already been diversified at the time of the flood, which is just 1,700 years or so after the formation of the earth, <coughs> according to creation. So all those probanognathids that are in the fossil record, they died in the flood. They had to have been created from a created kind on day whatever, and then diversified before the flood, and then their kind would have had to have been on the ark and then somehow or other went extinct after the ark because even by the answers in genesis's own list 54 percent of all the kinds on the ark went extinct yeah. boy that's a bad preservation rate yeah yeah <laughs> and, and, it's, and really i mean you look at it what exactly is a kind i mean our ele i mean i'm going to use this one uh elephants are supposed to be a kind but do you know how much food it would take to feed the elephant any just a single elephant for a year? Of and course, that just, carnivorous oh, issue. They have to have all the carnivores, oh, not the carnivores. Yeah, but but they had sharp teeth, you know, for for eating those really scary watermelons. Melons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tyrannosaurs had <laughs> six inch long steak knives, serrated teeth to eat melons or bark off of trees. I'm not making you know, this it, up. It is, yeah. it is, it, you know, you had to have you had to have those big powerful legs for running because you just got to chase those carrots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then, of course, the, in the flood, as we all know, uh, one of my favorite lines from one of the old creationist books, I think I quoted it in Dynamania. Uh, was the fact that we don't find the um, uh, angiosperms until way high in the fossil record in the Cretaceous. Are, and are so they? the idea of these fast sprinting rhododendrons <laughs> that were, yeah, that were no, beating right. out the yeah. trilobites in the, in, the, uh, in the flood sorting. RJ, I want to say real quick, it is 40 after and you haven't done your midsection. Uh, oh, I was just thing. setting that up, my, my okay. shameless plug for help. Yeah, I just yeah. saw that. I'm like, well, you usually do it about 10 minutes ago. So I, I normally say do something. it. I, I was a discussion. So here's the screen share. Everybody seeing that? Yeah. Uh, here's the, there's my tip patrons. Uh, thank you all, Stephen and Dyer and Andrew and Eat. Andrew is new, by the way. Uh, Yui uh, Fermanick, you'll know Andy from uh, the Psy Strike uh, show. Uh, Mona and Henrel and Jen and Jody and Daniel and Ralph and Eric and Benjamin and Staggles and Alex and Suris and Totas Real and Everett Vincent and Paul Williams. Thank you all. Uh, there's my website again. Behold and partake uh, of all the material. Uh, technically, the Patreon site, which uh, relates to the video, but they are slow as molasses on getting money to me. Hear that, Andy? 
Uh, so if you really want to help uh, the project, uh, there's GoFundMe.com, DCGo, and of course my books, both uh, Slam Dunk and the novel uh, Paralogs of Phileas Fogg are available by link at TortukanWordPress.com. Another reason for you to go to the site. I'm a struggling social security guy that cannot afford to, to get ink and not necessarily even food in that. So I can use the help. I've got thousands of followers on Twitter, but not thousands of supporters. Uh, there are 25,000 people that have seen Pologia's uh, uh, interview with me on his show and not even 250 of them helping. So I could use some more help out here in the hinterlands because this is work uh, to tell everybody what I'm doing. I'm, I'm constructing a data field uh, that's never been assembled before. I've just now hit uh, 25,000 sources in my uh, tip data field. And I'm uh, knocking down all the source base that anti-evolutionists have used. And that means I understand where they're building their arguments from so I can target them. So Evolution Slam Dunk came about by noticing what didn't have a good brick in the wall of the defense wall before. Nobody had really done anything on the reptile mammal transition except technical work that's been done for other mammal paleontologists, but it wasn't popping up very often. And nobody had gone through and looked at how all the creationists had looked at the issue. And so I thought that's a missing hole. So I wrote the book that filled that hole. And uh, it's it's all it needs. By the way, if anybody out there knows a publisher that publishes really live books, and as an, a literary agent or anybody else, get them in touch with me because I would really like to do uh, the illustrated second edition where I would want to put in pictures and I would have to get rights to all of that and a normal publisher and go on like normal book tour and uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, this would be at a college level for uh, quality as Christine Janis said, the Bamble paleontologist, that it was a college level. Uh, all it needed was illustrations to be perfect. And so I want to get to that. Thank you very much. So there's the shameless plug. And um, um, uh, we'll, uh, I'll point out that we're continuing at it. Jackson and we, Weed and I uh, are doing um, a book where we're going to analyze the answers in Genesis Answers books. This was another area that I realized, wait a minute. Yeah, nobody's actually done that. There's been spot criticism of bits and pieces, but nobody's really pulled all of this material together to do a comprehensive demolition job on a bunch of the answers books. And we're in the process of doing that. I'm doing the radiometric dating chapters and probably a big section on the flood. And uh, Jackson's handling the rest on there. And, and he's just been finished a couple chapters. And I'm being the anal retentive geek who coordinates the reference bibliography and the uh, master index and all that kind of stuff. Because that's right up my alley. There are people that just their eyeballs glaze over at that kind of grunt work. But for me, that's easy peasy. I, I would be one of those people. I'd be like, oh, God, just... Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't do. Yeah, the well, whole, old scratch. I hate it. Work. Then you got it. The first round around. Everybody out there. First of all, I've been watching to see who else is putting up reviews of the book. Everybody who has read the um, uh, either one of my books who hasn't done a review of it, is there some brick wall protecting you from doing that? Please do that. Yeah. Also, I mean, tell everybody in your networks. Tweet about it. Go on your social media. Uh, shake the rattle and things to say, hey, you know, this is uh, for anybody who wants to to uh, vaporize creationists when they say, well, there's just no evidence for macro evolution. Hell's bells, you've got ammo with slam dunk. <laughs> yeah. And, and on my review, I, I know I wrote, I mean, the worst thing I can say about evolution slam dunk is only one thing. At times, it reads like a freaking textbook and is boring as hell. That's about the worst thing I could say on it. Yeah, and and it was intentionally structured to straddle that. If I wanted to write a light, popular work, if I was going to go Bill Nye, the problem is you're operating at Bill Nye level. But this is something that needed to be in a new way of approaching the problem, which is to have a solid mass of information that is technically accurate, up to date, really up to date and is one that if you are technically minded and scientifically minded, you're not going to feel in the least bit talked down to on this, that you will have ammunition where I was delighted to learn that Christine Janice had to revise her latest mammal book she's working on because she found information in her field on the little dinosaur or the therapsid poop from the Permian she hadn't known about. Yeah. 
because it was in a relatively obscure technical journal. And, and so she was finding out this stuff that she didn't know about in her own field. Well, that's because I'm a really diligent researcher. <laughs> yeah, you are. So, so RJ, what you're saying is that in there, there's a crappy argument somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, and it's crap up the yin yang and yeah. you will, you'll see how bad Dwayne Gish was, how bad Michael Denton still is, how pathetic oh. the intelligent design gang is. Uh, the, the head up their ass maneuvering of Woodmarap uh, and answers in Genesis. Uh, that it's just, I, I literally cover everybody that you know the entire counter argument that any anti evolutionist can offer you. And that's why I was curious to talk with C and Nephilim, who did not show up, uh, because it's, it's a matter of I know what you don't know, and I know what you could know. And I'm trying to see where you're coming at this data field while you're trying to maneuver around the fact that you don't know anything about it. Yeah, R RJ, you mean that Dwayne Gish is wrong and dinosaurs didn't breathe fire? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, How for that, you have such for an that argument. Read, for that, you can read Dynomania at the website. That's a free. <laughs> Uh, I went into that uh, on there uh, that uh, he uh, he did that in a kid's book back in the 1990s oh. and uh, uh, dinosaurs by design or some such thing. I can't remember exactly what it was. And um, uh, it's all in there. And it was it was a, a argument so lame, so tendentious, so stupid. It didn't make sense, even from the point of view of the fossil that he had illustrated. It was just awful. And uh, uh, and to this day, you still have uh, some creationists. Kent Hovind was trying to imply that there might be fire-breathing dragons, baryonyx uh, in England, that that would be the dragon that was slain by St. George. And you're just going, oh, oh my God, God, this is the, the Flintstones no, version of paleontology. The, the dragon supposedly slain by St. George was not a dragon. It was some sort of, um, I want to say it was like a monitor lizard or something like that. Ooh, animal, well, even then, you're uh, still not dealing with dinos it's breathing it's fire. fire. An image I saw yeah. showed a Parasaurolophus breathing fire onto a predator. That was the one from the Gish Kids book. And I, if I could ever do illustrated editions of a lot of these things, I'd want to have that stuff in there. There, there are so many. In my twenty odd years of researching all of this stuff, there are so many cases of where I've gone. Oh, I wish I were making this up but I'm not. Yeah. It, it's like when I first heard you mention the dinosaurs breathing fire bit, someone, and I'm like, I was like, okay, RJ, you're a really good researcher. I trust your research, but this guy had to been trolling you. Like, like it had to been a troll. No one could have seriously. Yeah. And then I started looking more into it and I'm like, oh God, no, RJ was right. He was serious. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was it was a, a, a tendentious argument because what he was trying to do was use it as a lead in for the bombardier beetle. And so that was what his little favorite hobby horse. The problem is, is that it was terribly ironic that somebody who was trained as a biochemist should manage to get so many of the biological details of the bombardier beetle wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the and bombardier that was just beetle is actually one of it is actually one of the more fun ones because it doesn't it's actually an acid. Mm -hmm. that, they're, that they're kicking out rather that that uh, that catches fire on if i remember correctly actually catches fire on contact it there. oxidizes and it just generates heat in the process of that oxidization and i, I tracked down the thing and he and gish in his versions which he tended to put in the kids books he got the moderators backwards he got the, the reaction <laughs> sequence wrong yeah. and i'm going oh oh dwayne yeah. dwayne <laughs> you're a biochemist did you is brain farting that much of a problem among tortukans well yeah. you also have to realize that by the time by the time dwayne gish decided to decided to coin the gish gallop he hadn't been he hadn't been an active biochemist in a number of years. Oh, true, yeah. I mean, he got his degree back in the 1960s, as I recall, and he basically was running off of that. But it's revealing that that he was the paleontology guy for creationism. He was a point man. That that there was nobody in the young earth creationism field that was as assiduous in going after paleontology stuff. And those were the major themes of his lectures and writing of which uh, the 1995 book, Evolution, the Fossils Still Say No, 
um, is uh, his opus magnum. And there's been very, very little direct criticism of that in the anti-creationism literature. And I'm going, excuse me, but this is a goldmine of dumb. You want to go <laughs> into this that, uh, that, that from a source methods direction. I had hit some of this stuff when I first did the uh, the old uh, tip work back uh, um, in the early 2000s. But when I hit it again for Slam Dunk, I knew way more than I had back in 2004. And I also had access to way more information. So I was finally able to track down the Allen article that was a technical paper that uh, Gish had misrepresented. Nobody had tracked that down before and looked at what he was claiming about the article versus what was in it. And thankfully, I, I uh, knew um, uh, Jay Zilo uh, from uh, the uh, Carnegie in, in uh, Pittsburgh. And I said, hey, do you have a copy of this? And he said, sure, and, and emailed it to me. So I was able to see the original text. And at that point, I realized, holy moly, has he misrepresented this uh, chart. And in an yeah. Ill illustrated version, I'd want to be able to put all that in so everybody could just see how the shell game that he was playing with the facts on this. And you're just going, oh, no, no. No, Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to point out something that uh, Animal, Animal Man said to me. It's a cat brownie, a fire-breathing parasol office, and I'm sure I screwed the name. I'm sorry. Parasol Yeah, that word. It's worse than anything <laughs> Jurassic Park will ever get wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, um, the other fun one. Uh, old Scratch mentions myocids. Uh, that's one of my little favorites, too. The myocids are those basal carnivores from which the dogs and cats come from. And boy, there's another subject that's eventually going to be a, a under my uh, scope of where they don't discuss myocids, the creationists. And then, of course, over at Intelligent Design Land, they don't pay any attention to systematics at all. Um, I've been monitoring uh, Gunter Beckley, uh, which uh, he keeps on shooting his mouth off. I did a thing, I think, last week where I put up some linkages to Beckley while we were discussing the stuff with uh, Godfrey World. And um, uh, you can check back in the previous video on that and find out about that stuff. Uh, because um, biogeography is just a fascinating yeah. example of evolution in action. And to see Beckley trotting down the Casey Luskin daisy train of um, trying to argue, well, these evolutionists can't explain some of these biogeographical puzzles. Well, what the hell is his explanation for them? Uh, are they are they designed? Uh, did God, uh, while not paying attention to the Holocaust, decide to really make sure there was a particular variety of tarantula in on this island in Australia? Is that the priorities yeah. we got here? Yeah, but but they they were uh they were specifically designed and put there by God because yeah, uh, they were. Uh, if he they, wants to argue that, fine, volcanoes. but doesn't argue that that's the problem we don't know what it is he thinks happened he doesn't get to that level and no intelligent designer does that you got to at least give props to the nincompoop creationists because they are forced by the circumstances to deal with speciation they've got to deal with kindology baromenology they got to work out how many created kinds there are there the, the ark has a limited booking plan so they have to figure out how to get things that won't overfill the ark into the stuff we can see in the fossil record in the living world. And that's not an easy trick. But if you're an intelligent designer or you Ross, uh, where they've got all the time in the world to play with billions and billions of years, it just becomes a fog bank to where they don't bother about explaining anything. But they need to explain it. They need to explain probiotic nathids and myocids and parasaurolophids. They need to explain why basal dinosaurs look the way they do, uh, why basal crocodilians look the way they do, why uh, we're finding feathered theropods and all of these things. And and you get this tippy toe past the data field, but darn it all, you got to explain the data. That's number three in the in the rules of sound reasoning. You got to explain the data. You got to seek out every scrap and try to make sense out of it. And rough. No, nope, none of them do that. Are they can't. They, it's simple. It's simple. They all were created by God, specially, and then after the flood to get them everywhere, Noah loaded them, showed all the animals into one volcano, and it fired them off to where they need to yeah, be. And I, and I wish we were making this up, but the fact <laughs> is that there have been creationists who have seriously suggested, they're minor league creationists, but still, that some of the koalas and such arrived in Australia 
as ballistic ejecta. <laughs> you, know you know what? There's a sad part to this is that last I checked, I koalas did wouldn't do very well sucking uh, sucking hard vacuum for an hour and a half. Can you, yeah, you, you think about the mission. squirrel? <laughs> if the squirrel in the uh, uh, the uh, mammoth, uh, the uh, Ice Age movies, you know, all the yeah. little troubles he gets into. Can Threat. you see some little koala yeah. with his little eyeballs opened up <laughs> as he's riding a volcanic <laughs> rock in there going, yeah! <laughs> and trying to uh, hold on to the so that can have uh, some heat. Oh, let me, so let me shut everybody up in here. Psy Strike has said, I'm inspired by tonight's Evolution Hour. Science Strike Force will award one copy of Evolution Slam Dunk for the best use of the hashtag Tortukan Alert on Twitter in the hour following this show. Got that, gang? <laughs> oh, that's, and that's and awesome. use Tortukan Alert. I mean, you know, make it yeah. trending, damn it. Whenever you yeah. encounter anybody, not just a creationist, who clearly has problems with source methods, that's what Tortukan Alert should be for. And I will put I it into the thing. Hashtag Tortukan Alert. Um... Yeah, no, it, it, it and, and on the qual of it, I'll, I'll say this real quick. Not, I mean, even if they could survive the hard vacuum, you know, that would kill them off immediately. Um, yeah, the re entry, the heat from re entry, and <laughs> not even that'll, even if they survived the well, heat, from well, the, the pre flood, the, the pre flood uh, koalas had off. exceptionally thick fur, perhaps. And well, <laughs> see, here's, the, here's your problem. The exceptionally thick photo would protect them for, would, would would might could pr protect them from the temp from the actual from the actual amount of heat they would be absorbing, or that wouldn't they wouldn't be absorbing while they while they were on their ballistic trajectory above the atmosphere. Unfortunately, it's really not the fall that gets you; it's the sudden stop at yeah. the end. Yeah, yeah, they are yeah. going to survive. We do know, the, that, uh, we do know that the active tortucan, however, has an exceptionally thick carapace that prevents them from actually absorbing any information at all that conflicts yeah. with what they want to have inside. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I just always, whenever I hear that argument, I'm just, it's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. It's like, you know, the forces that they would hit with upon yeah. landing, it, it would, There's there a wouldn't mass. even be. It would be There's what? a mass of there are Group? ranges of stupid in anti-evolutionism, and and the the, the flame throwing Parasaurolophus <laughs> is one of them. Uh, uh, but there are others. That the, my favorite uh, is the the lunar dust myth. That one pops up oh. every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I was just exploring a little bit more on that because I found a way of working it into the new uh, book. Uh, with Jackson Wheat because it uh, it happened that one of the guys, um, uh, Monty White, in his thing uh, quoted the uh, line of from you to from goo to you via the zoo as a shorthand version of evolution, and I was puzzling when that became a, a trope in creationism, yeah. and I tracked down some stuff on it. And one of the people who had been one of the first to use that was this guy Harold Hill. No, no connection to the Music Man. Guy. Yeah, I was just about ready to say, was he a Music Man? What do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? You talk? Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you but anyway, know? this Harold Hill was one of the people who, back in the early '70s, had popularized the lunar dust myth. Um, if you don't know what the lunar dust myth was, oh, I... it was the argument that the moon could not be billions of years old because there would have been a huge pile of dust on the moon, yeah. and that this was uh, uh, come about from all of that. So he, uh, oh no, no, the other, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I just had a brain fart. It wasn't the lunar dust myth. It was the 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 uh, uh, Joshua's missing day. That was the thing that he was pro promoting. Yeah, uh, my, the longest thing on that one. Joshua's missing day. Which one was that? Yeah, That's this this was day. one. The, the, uh, the, it was in the early seventies, uh, and it was still popping up in there, and, and it's pretty much been uh, dumped on by regular creationists. Here's the story that it was being told in the seventies: is that uh, some NASA scientists have, were doing a program to calculate the positions of the stars before the lunar Apollo flight. And they found that as it, they, they decided to let it run retro calculating back. And when it hit a, a pre-Christian period, it suddenly stopped like a rock. And though they couldn't figure out why the program was glitching up until some sweet, humble little uh, a Christian scientist uh, put his hand up and said, oh, you have to take into account the hours from the day that was longer because Joshua had stopped the sun, you see, during the Battle of Jericho. Yeah. And as soon as they put that in, the thing worked just fine. And, and they, they immediately should have had a problem with this, 
uh, uh, because of the fact that there would have been no way a computer program would know that and that no one could track down the provenance of this thing. But it turned out that this story actually had a, a, a pedigree before the NASA part. Harold Hill had apparently glommed onto versions of it, but earlier it had been passed around by Harold Rimmer uh, back in the, um, uh, Harry Rimmer back in the 1930s. And it came from this guy, Totten, who was this crackpot anti-Semite uh, who was predicting the apocalypse constantly during the 1890s. And he was the one that originally came up with the story. And then later it got, it got filtered into Rimmer and then transmogrified into NASA uh, in the Harold Hill era in the 1970s. So uh, that was... Uh, yeah. uh, here's the problem. This NASA video. didn't exist in any form before... Not, before, before oh, yeah, yeah, I know. But the, the newer version of it added NASA. But the original tale predated that, and it showed this trope. But but anybody who could have thought about it, even the creationists dumped on it. Jonathan Sarfati and everybody else by the 1990s, they were putting out things saying, don't use this, please, 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 don't use this. But every once in a while, people will still repeat the damn Joshua missing day thing and the and the lunar dust bit. That was that was due I, to Henry Morris. I'm sorry, I I, uh, yeah, I misattributed no, it to Harold. I, I was going to ask if you can send me stuff on that lunar dust myth because. I have a video. Oh, it's there. Just download the damned uh, chapter one of Old Tip. I put, I put okay. the discussion in there. It's at the tail okay. end. I, I didn't see, know. See, I've got where, all this crap in my website, yeah, kid. I, I didn't uh, know Brian where it was in your that, tip. That's what I was going to ask. Brian you could, like, says that, that he remembers hearing that NASA story. Uh, this, this one was troping around, and it's less popular now, but it's still knocking around there. Uh, Animal says, at least answers in Genesis try to be more reasonable and say animals went around the world due to land bridges like in the Ice Age, except yeah. all over the planet. Or... <laughs> There was not no evidence of a fossil record for any such thing. And yeah, then, Kurt uh, Wise, um, his version of things is that there are these giant floating islands of vegetation with whole ecosystems on them, which yeah. uh, I've been waiting for him to do more technical work on that mm -hmm. because that one, in its own way, is another fire-breathing breathing Parasaurolophus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then uh, earlier Animal I Man think, said... I giving them too much credit there, okay. Yeah, Animal Man well, said to you, RJ. Wise is a paleontologist. He's got a degree, studied under Stephen Jay Gould, so he has no excuse whatsoever for not being aware of the technical literature. But RJ, <laughs> we can't trust Stephen Jay Gould, remember? According to Get Home, and he's a communist professor or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I get that. And, and that and Richard Dawkins, boo, hiss. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I put the website up there. I, I got a bunch of stuff down there. You've got, yeah. you can download any of the chapters and things. Dynamania, if you want to find out about flood geology and about ancient astronauts and Atlantis and, uh, uh, and, and Noah's Ark and all that stuff. There's a ton of stuff in Dynamania. Want to find out about uh, human evolution and, and the wackiness there. There's the uh, evolution of the um, Planet of the Apes, Chapter 5. If you want to find out more about why the Bible is a pile of dingoes kidneys in the contradiction department, because uh, the Bible tells me so, that's Chapter 6. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that yeah. it won't do diddly if you don't read the damn things. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, reading the things is not that hard. But I do but, it all the time. I like it. But I don't want to read. Reading's mm -hmm. boring. Mm, well, uh, it apparently is for Rupi and Sanford uh, as, uh, to RJ, get us back around to our connection on there. RJ, so, uh, I was gonna ask uh, a, a frustrated atheist, I was just going to ask you uh, 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 what your reaction has been to our show this hour. Um, well, I mean, it's been good. I just, I really wish a creationist would stay on so that way I can. Um, yeah, grow yeah I was disappointed that, that C bugged out and that Nephilim didn't show up. Um, that um, I'll, hmm. there may be an, a thing in future no. uh, where I would do that, but I'm still going to want to ask him about that jaw issue, and uh, yeah, I want to deal with that. My, like I said, uh, like I said in the uh, chat when before the um, show even started, one of my biggest um, favorite uh, subjects is, of course, the um, Australopithecines and the uh, early uh, yeah humanoid um creatures so whenever um people really take issue with um australopithecine and saying that it wasn't um a transition i really take issue with that because it's like yeah um with all the in fact and, and have, here's the here's the methods question <coughs> that that i want everybody to get used to asking is if somebody makes that claim oh it's not a transition the next thing that you should say is oh what would a transition look like 
And you'll find that they've never thought about that, and you won't be able to get them to think about it. And why would yeah. they think about such well, a thing? They're Tortukans, after all. Yeah, frustrated. Exactly. I, 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 will I don't say understand this. the two. I don't hold on before you say that. I don't understand the Tortugan reference. Oh, oh, this is oh. the term I came up with. Uh, it, it's from the Latin for turtle, tortuga, and I wanted a term to describe somebody that has a mental mind shell. It's something where where you can throw data at them until the cows come home, and it just bounces right off. It, it it never permeates. They've got a narrow vision. They're just looking out the shell, and that's their world. That's all they can see. And I didn't want to insult turtles by calling them turtle minds. So I, I came up with the Tortukan thing, Tortukan. and it was a nice, easy term. And it, it connects up with a subconcept, which is Matthew Harrison Brady syndrome, MHBS for short. I got a lecture on <laughs> the ill-winded Tortuka. Uh, that I liked, yes, didn't you like the fact that the BS at the end? See, that's why I, I acronymed it that way. It was from, <laughs> um, it was from the old Scopes trial where uh, William Jennings Bryan was uh, grilling uh, Clarence Darrow, and, and it was then incorporated into an inherit the wind and in the play and the movie but this was in the original transcript is uh daryl was asking him uh, trying to pin him down on how long the days of creation were he could, just couldn't get him to explain it and finally um uh, brian said i don't think about things i don't think about and daryl said do you ever think about the things you do think about <laughs> <laughs> like who thinks about the things they don't think about like that, that well uh, brian exactly doesn't and so I, I thought about this, and with regarding Richard Milton, who is um, a functional young Earth creationist without being religious, I didn't think that was possible. But when you look what? at his post methods, you discovered that. He's a relatively minor figure, and, and I go into him a lot in Dynomania, so you can read all about him in there. He's still around. He's about my age. He a, a, was editor of British Mensa magazine, so obviously he can do those little rotation puzzles and all that claptrap stuff. But clearly, as a scholar, he is my my poster child for scholarly incompetence. And uh, he's addicted to secondary sources and all that. And I, I realized that what if what Brian was saying was a was a kind of a Freudian slip, that he really doesn't think about things he doesn't think about. And I realized that could account for Richard Milton, it could account for uh, Philip Johnson in the intelligent design movement, very bright people who just don't think about things. And I realized that when I was looking at their scholarship, what subjects came up in their anti-evolution crusades and what subjects weren't and how they would skirt around an issue. And if you would ask them about this, they would be answering somewhere else. I realized this was the common behavioral trait that I was seeing. And so I coined the term Tortukan to describe somebody whose cognitive landscape, capital T, um, uh, is dominated by this Matthew Harrison Brady syndrome, this ability to not think about stuff that they don't think about. And you can imagine a variety of different cognitive landscapes where some people have a bunch of little Tortukan ruts, they're all rather shallow, uh, uh, shallow. they might have one gigantic coalesced uh, uh, Tortukan rut, and young earth creationists are often like that, where they've got a whole worldview and it's really deep. And you throw information and it just bounces off the shell and things that are sucked like a black hole into their Tortukan ruts, you just can't get them past mm. them. And so when, if you ask somebody a, a question that is hitting one of their Tortukan ruts, you get the deer in the headlight because they literally don't think about the thing you're asking them about and their brain has got to go, uh, here, talk about this. And they'll be answering a question you didn't ask. And that's when insert Gish Gallop. Yeah. Bingo. And so th that you can find that out. So I coalesced the Tortukan mind down to four basic things. And I've said this before, but I'll say it again because uh, everybody needs to know about it. First, uh, I identified this in the creationism movement, but I think it's a universal that applies everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely at it, you'll see the same behavior. But in creationism, they're addicted to secondary sources. Oh, are they addicted to secondary sources? Uh, we know this in the flat earther movement. We know this in anti-vaxxers. They, they read the thing, they see the pundit, they got the thing and they, 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 they repeat it relentlessly. In the creationism thing, in the tip project that I'm trying to do with no budget, I'm literally measuring this. Out of over 2,300 anti-evolutionists that have generated some 8,800 sources, 95% of that does not cite primary sources. So I don't have to guess at this number, I'm measuring it. Now, of the 5% who do, it's a small cadre of only some 100 some odd people. But a lot of them are secondary source addicts. They're copying somebody else, too. So Kent Hovian may cite a primary source, but it's not because he's researching it directly. He's copying some other creationist. Same thing with Hank Hanegraaff and a lot of them. So how many core fact claimants are there? Well, that's a small bunch. And in the current anti-evolution movement, 
it's only about 50 people. That's their fact claimants. And about two thirds of those are young earth creationists and the remaining ones are uh, intelligent designers. But you could literally gather into a meeting room at the Holiday Inn, all of the fact claimants in anti-evolutionism. It's that small of a bunch. Uh, in some cases, like Casey Luskin, when he was still operating at the Discovery Institute, 14% of the entire intelligent design literature is just Casey Luskin postings. So Which you get this- bad, really, because Casey's a freaking idiot. Uh, he's a Tartukan, yes. Uh, a very, he's, <laughs> he, he, he is the Dwayne Gish of intelligent design. Uh, that um, uh, he's a, a detail fiddler. Uh, that's what I describe Gish as. Somebody that, that cites technical literature and he talks technical and he's got the little technical terms and all that stuff. But as so soon as you start fine. investigating at the source methods level, where you're looking at <sighs> what sources they cite and what they quote and what they don't, he starts dissolving the same way Gish does. So does that so explain like Tartuken a little Nephilim, better? Kind of like the way Nephilim Free does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Nephilim and C that we were just talking to early, these would be parasitical <laughs> secondary source addicts. They're they're well, in the same that, mode as Kent Hobing. Yeah. Hmm? But not only does he do not only does Nephilim Free do that, but he has this problem whenever he does do a uh, uh, actual source, he doesn't get past the abstract. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's probable he glommed onto it. That's one of the reasons why I, I have a kind of smug arrogance when I'm dealing with a lot of creationists online, because uh, especially in Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, um, you'll find examples of where the creationist has lobbed a technical paper at me. And I go, oh, gosh, that's one that's been cited by anti-evolutionists before. Did you get this from a secondary source? And they start clamming up on that because I've detected... <laughs> where they're getting stuff from. And so it's very unusual for me not to find an awful lot of repetition. There was a creationist, um, in fact, he's the brother, I believe, of the Reverend Wilson that uh, Christopher Hitchens debated quite a few years ago. Um, and he, Idaho minister, uh, um, I, I think his name is Wilson or something. He's a, a, a guy that defends Southern slavery. I mean, he's a, a weird piece of work. Anyway, uh, I bump into his brother every once in a while down there at the Darwin on the Palouse. I didn't see him this last year. I think he's beginning to realize I show up at those things and I'll recognize him and we'll have a chit chat. But he was talking to me at one uh, run, well, away run away quick. Run away, run away, run away. Run away. Uh, brave Sir Robin, run away. Uh, yeah. And um, so you got, um, he was talking about feather evolution and I was talking with him about it and he started trotting out. Don't you know that there's this particular uh, inability oh. to explain feathers from scales? And I go, Ooh, you're quoting the brush quote from 1996, aren't you? And he just startled. Uh, <laughs> RJ, look at the chat and what Andy just said. Uh, personally, I think that's the worst. To... It's a great book. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, uh, that, in, with, with smug arrogance, it bit. is a great book. I am, I am effing proud of Evolution Slam Dunk. I bit off a big problem, and I <laughs> did a full court press analysis that operates at a full technical level. Uh, the bloody bibliography runs a hundred pages of small print. It's yeah. massive. So this is a resource that you can draw on with confidence and care. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm proud of the damn thing. I want more people to buy it because it's a damn good book, and I need the money. <laughs> I get royalties yeah. off. I, I know I bought two copies, although I only have one because the other one went to a friend of mine. And I yeah. hopefully might be able to later in the year or so maybe get a couple more for the uh, school yeah. library where I'm going. So yeah, request your library look into it because they will occasionally buy books of that time. They may, if they don't, they don't, no big deal, yeah. but maybe they will. Uh, and uh, that means it'll be available for everybody to check out. You know, I won't make any extra royalties on the damn thing, but at least the information will be there because yeah. it don't do a damn bit of good how much information you got if it's not used and shared. I was just grieving when Jade died. And yeah. I knew all of the research that she had compiled, f tracking down Kent Hovind sources and the like. This was an enormous resource base. And I was trying to get her to post this stuff, to do PDF scans and make a website where this would be available. And then she died. So I have no idea what's going to happen to all that information. Even if I'm struck by lightning or, or drop dead from an aneurysm, at least I know that Slam Dunk is out there, that the material on the website is out there, that the stuff that I've done on these videos are there that will exist, at least, as some contribution that I've been able to do to this field and hopefully prod people to get on the source bandwagon. Because 
We're in a golden age of information. Holy yeah. shit, can we find this stuff easy? And there's therefore no excuse whatsoever. See, Brown, you, before you bugged out, there is no effing excuse for the ignorance that you display. Your superficiality, your laziness. In a world right. where we are awash with primary science work as easily accessible as a damn mouse click, no, no, no. It, it's not, yeah. not, no justification. Yeah, I, I ran into some, I think it was an anti evolutionist, and uh, one of their arguments for against evolution was like, you know, because it was, uh, oh, he's in there. Um, and, and they said something like about how like oh i think you're so arrogant that you claim to have this knowledge and you think that now we live in this time when we only have this knowledge and i'm like yeah we are lucky to live in this time where we have access to all this knowledge at once i mean I, this is probably one of the greatest times to be alive because you have access to all of this yeah, yeah, Browns in the chat. Read, yeah, somebody that don't have money I know exactly how that. C. Brown is in the chat. James, do you want to have a real discussion or do you just want to control and micromanage? I don't want to have you go running off at the mouth diuretic-like. Uh, I do want to have a direct discussion. And uh, 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 atheist in the room as well wanted to have a discussion on that point. You still have the link and you can come back into the room. But it is my show and i want to discuss that jaw transition issue and i have four specific questions that i gave you a complete heads up on beforehand and i want to discuss those because i don't think you know diddly squat about any of those yeah. and i want you to prove me wrong by actually discussing those subjects you can tell somebody that knows a field by how they discuss data field at that level and I don't think you bother to look. And since there's no excuse for that level of ignorance, that's what we want to explore. Yeah. And I see Nephilim didn't show up either. He may not have checked his email. I don't know. Uh, I, I told C. Brown to, uh, to keep a, a, a contact with him. And I, I said that I would be sending it about 4.30. And I actually sent it in earlier. Than, so there was certainly time on that. But, I, uh, but um, if I were on his show... That would be one thing, and he could control the debate in any way that he wishes. But excuse me, my my show, my ball, yeah. and um, I, I have specific issues to deal with. He he just said uh, I'm not in class. Uh, I, I don't know. You ought to be he, in class. See, you need a lot of not, class. I, I go. Time. Does he not realize your nickname is Professor Downard for a reason? This is our lecture <laughs> hour. And this is yeah. where we come to learn. <laughs> if so he yes, should be able to have explained, even if he'd watched the damn show, he could have repeated the point. But he needs to account for why. How could a biological system have avoided going exactly through that predicted stage in order to get from a reptile to a mammal jaw? And we would have to then ask, was the designer such a complete ignoramus, such a dunce, that he went out of his way to make a form of life that was predicted on evolutionary grounds if there had never been such an evolution. That to me is just inexplicable. Yeah, I mean, I would love to, I mean, I have a few questions for him, you know, that yeah. I would love to ask, but I'll let you, you know, get yours out of the way first, always, because it's your show. I mean, I may want to ask I mean, the, yeah. the, obviously, this is an area that you're interested in, in terms of Australopithecines, and so you would be perfectly happy to ask him a variety of specific issues on yeah. that foot issue. My, yeah, my, my main I mean, question is... Go ahead. Go ahead. Looks like we may, it looks like he may have bailed again. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, he's he's yeah, long yeah. on. Uh, I know. I can't remember what the hell his moniker was, but I'm. I believe he was the same one that showed up quite a lot on uh, a McRae's feed, and he would just go on and on and on about these things. It was it yeah. was, he would just want a tirade, and you could never ask him a specific question and get a straightforward answer. Uh, the 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 thing that another thing that shows up really blatantly in uh, anti-evolutionism and in every head up their ass cranial blockage of the rectum error is that there's a disconnect between specific example and generality. You get generalities without any specific examples and if you ask them they can't give any, that's always a dead giveaway. Or they 
go after specific examples, but can't generalize and understand larger contexts. One of the things that C. Brown was railing at me on at the beginning of the whole exchange, way back when I was just starting the series, was polystrate fossils. And oh. uh, it's one of the shibboleths of young earth creationism. And uh, that there are very, there's remarkably few examples of them. Most of them are clearly pyroclastic flows, which we now know way more and, and about. And an awful lot of the creationist literature is riffing off of really old geology works that are occurring before they really thought through a lot about pyroclastic flows and volcanism. So it you know, isn't, it's just, isn't the, is that the, what, what you just said, isn't that the whole entire layering of um, volcanic ash? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. pyroclastic flow. Yeah, I, 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 I'm more than casually familiar with it being in the backyard of, of my, Mount St. Helens. Uh, because as, as uh, uh, Crocus Squirrel and I were discussing earlier, I've shoveled Mount St. Helens off my driveway during the 1980 <laughs> eruption. Pyroclastic well, flows are, are, are superheated gas masses that you oh, see them rolling down uh, hills in volcanoes, and you realize, oh, that looks like a big cloud of dust. It's a cloud of boilingly hot dust that's so hot that it literally disintegrates. Oh, and you there realize, we go. Oh, we got C like back in the room. Dust. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, yeah. now so well, one of the letters literally disintegrates. Nobody's got their, their background for yeah. it. Let's see. Uh, now, now. We're getting feedback. Yeah, we're getting, we, somebody's got their thing. They need to mute their uh, uh, background feedback as soon as that see, gets to the see, point. See, I muted talk. you. I muted you because you need to figure out a way to be able to correct that. That's yeah, we can't hear a damn thing. The audience deserves a civil conversation that is yeah. not full of feedback looping. And that won't that won't work. So as soon as you figure what? that one back out, let me find we'll out whether he's got. Listen uh, to you. Yeah. He yeah. should be able to unmute um, himself. Yeah. Yeah, he can unmute himself. Yeah, we, oh, go ahead and unmute him. Um, uh, frustrated. Oh, oh, there the he goes. That saves me trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he can unmute himself. Yeah. Frustrated. Yeah, we're getting feedback still. Yeah. Mute yourself, mute yourself, see, see uh, correct the problem, and when yeah, you want see, to mute, try make sure to, you don't have a problem. Try to turn off whatever um, whatever you're watching on YouTube, the YouTube feed, turn that down all the way. Try to turn off whatever, uh, whatever you're watching on YouTube, the YouTube feed, turn that down all the way. Whatever, uh, okay, I'm muting you again, Seed, until you you got okay, it. Okay, I'm trying. I'm awesome, trying to figure awesome. it out. I'm trying to figure it out. What's there, going it's better on. now. Yeah, you got it now. You yeah. got it now. Whatever you did was perfect. That solves it. Okay, let's get back to the to the discussion. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll, well, because this was the thing where you left the room. Um, the issue about uh, the gate of chimpanzees versus human beings versus Australopithecines and all of that. So you brought up chimpanzees that they that they are capable of walking bipedally, which is not a news bulletin. We know all about that. But how do they differ from um, Australopithecines and humans? What what is your understanding of that? I mean, basically, Australopithecines and and chimps are the same thing. Basically, they, no, they, they aren't. Both, they're basically the same thing. Okay, let me no, ask you a aren't. question. Let me ask you a question. Okay, no, no, uh, this is this is a technical matter. No, they aren't. Even the sources that Rupi cited in that book that you read, the, the uh, Contested Bones, those sources explicitly, including Sussman, explicitly do not claim that Australopithecines are just like chimpanzees, and it is a bearing of false witness to suggest they do. So what sources are you relying on to think that they are? Okay, are you going to let me finish? Are you going to let me say what I want to say? If you're going to cut me off and you're going to try to shape how I talk, I'm going to leave the room. We, we got a, the I'm subject. A, Let's talk tell, about I'm gonna, the chimpanzees. I'm, I'm going to tell, I, I tell you what I think, okay? I'm not saying that Sussman, uh, all of these evolutionists believe that uh, Australopithecus was a monkey, okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying to you is, w w when I look at the literature, I look at the facts. I don't look at the ad hoc uh, rationalizations, okay? They are evolutionists, okay? They're trying to explain a phenomenon. Okay. So what facts cause you to think that Australopithecines no, no. and chimps are the same? 
I, I, I had to give you that. I had to give you that. I had to tell you that first for you to understand where I'm coming from. But you cutting me off. I had to so tell get you that to the first. facts. Get to the facts. Okay, I'm trying to get see. to the facts. But if I don't tell you what I was telling you, you won't understand what I'm trying to tell you. They just, don't, just I don't skip agree with. Facts. Listen, but I don't agree with everything in the papers. Get to them. Okay, what I'm telling you is this here. Basically, uh, the, the body shape, the, 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 the morphology of Australopithecus is very, very, very similar to a monkey. They, uh, they're adapted for. They're adapted to abbreviate uh, to, to the life in the trees, living in the trees. According to whom? According Do to you the say, literature. Are you saying according, that? Uh, it, it, according to the literature. According to li okay, okay, let me ask you a question. Okay, 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 let me ask you, okay, okay, let's ask a question. What parts of mm -hmm. Australopithecus was human? What parts was human? The, they they were almost human. They were okay, bipedal what? animals. That okay, also okay, well, had okay. arboreal characteristics. Their feet could uh, walk and climb both, as the Sussman work explicitly said, and which Rupi refused to quote. Rupi suppressed information. Are you claiming that Rupi did not suppress that information from his book? Okay. No. Okay, let me tell you. Uh, don't, don't cut me off. Rupi is not going to explain every detail of what uh, was said in, uh, as far as other business. What he yes, he does if he's going to oh, make an assertion. If Rupi is claiming, and wow. Rupi does claim, hey, James, that, James. let me let me, let me put in my point. Talking. Let me put in my point. Let me put in my point. Uh, uh, Rupi and Sanford are claiming that Australopithecines were not bipeds. None of the sources they are citing supports that contention, and they suppress at every single opportunity the information that says, no, they are bipedal. Are you claiming that Rupi and Sanford carefully analyzed and acknowledged that evidence and discussed it in their book at any point? Let me ask you a question. What type yes of foot? No. Uh, uh, no. I'm going to, uh, no. But it, it, there's not going to be a yes or no type of dialogue here. I'm well, going to tell you what I'm saying. questions gonna, are. See, you know, see, you can't see, you know what? If you don't allow me to speak, Jane, if, if you're that fueled, okay, uh, if you're a professor, if you're a professor, let me make my argument, then destroy my argument. So make you can't, you, okay, you make can't, your okay, argument. But stop make cutting me argument. off. You make you're making this you're making this harder by cutting me off. Okay. Australopithecus foot had a hollux foot like a monkey. Period. It, it had a chimp foot, it, it had that separation between the uh the big toe. It did not have a human foot. Monkeys Where did you get this walk. information from? From the literature. Are you telling me? Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. This is a precise, precise point. This is hey, a precise scholarly point. I'm about to hang up again. I'm about to hang up again because I'm trying to tell you my point. I listen to you. You. And I'm trying to make my, my point. Contend, sir. I'm, trying make my, I'm trying to make my point. You won't let me, let me make, make, make my point. But you have, a, you have okay, no okay. point. Are you saying? You are no you point, saying? Steve. Are you saying? Uh, let, let me ask you a question. What, yeah, foot was, what foot was found? What foot was found from Lucy? Was there any feet found? There have been foot bones found, yes, especially since the old sources that Rupi paid attention to. Are you arguing that Rupi paid attention to that later data? Yes, yeah, I, I am, because the thing about it is, okay, you did well, not which, find which of the later, Which of the later papers do you claim Rupi cited? Can you tell us that? Okay, I don't remember the exact papers, but listen, let me just say something. I'll tell you, he didn't. The, the only, the so only book. Please tell me. Wow. Uh, well, this, is, this will be something that you can research. James, I can't but, do this. Wait, wait, wait. I can't. James. 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 Let, James. Let, look. James, let me, let me address this. Uh, well, uh, uh, just a moment, frustrated. I'm going to ask. I want you to uh, uh, when C later on, He's because crazy, you've been talking about the videos. I want C to, to research that and to tell us in the uh, linkages to the video later uh, uh, in the comments what paper you claim Rupi cited that refers to these later foot bone things. So that's a, a project that you could look into. Now, frustrated, what was your point? No. Okay, so. I didn't finish my point. Go ahead, go ahead. Look, I'm, I'm going to let you finish your point, but I do wish that I can get some words in here for a sec. Okay, sure. So. What is your, um, what is the evidence, all the evidence behind loot, behind the Australopithecines being uh, not bipedal? They had a, for one, they had a monkey foot, they had an upper mm -hmm. body that, uh, that had a, a boreal living, they basically had long monkey arms, 
the hip, the hip that they had, they found was a crush hip. It had to be reconstructed, okay? And uh, they, they had monkey feet. They did not have human feet whatsoever, okay? So, and not only that, not only that, hold on, let me just say one thing. Not only that. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you. Okay, I, I, I guess I'm nervous because I think I'm de dealing with James. Not only no, that. You, you're dealing with me. I will let you finish. Right. Not, not only that is there is no mechanism where mutations uh, mutations could uh, um, effectively shape a uh, monkey-like creature. It's, no, no, there James, is, this is me. See, that's what I'm saying. There is not. There is no this mutations too. have been... James is too fueled. Well, look, I'm, what I'm, mutations, I'm, I'm, mutations, they're they're mean, what mutations are you science. saying? Here's, here's they're, a technical question. What, what genes do you claim can't mutate to do that? Do you know what genes are involved in the formation of the manis of uh, vertebrates? Uh, Hox genes, uh, to, to a certain extent. But the thing about it is, you have, okay, you have which a one of those do you claim can't mutate? No, no, no. Which, oh, which, no, cis, which cis regulatory right. sequences do you claim can't do that? I don't have to talk about the regulatory sequence. What I'm trying to tell you is, if you have a monkey, if you have a if you have a chimp type anatomy, okay, a chimp type anatomy would have to evolve into a human type anatomy. That means you would have to have a sequence of mutations that okay. would have to work. In a, hold on, James. James, something wrong with please, you, James. Please, please. I'm done. Shush. I'm done. I'm done. I, 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 I ain't dealing with you, James. Listen to my well. questions. Then please. deal with me. Deal with me. Hold no, on. I on. told you. Deal with me. Listen to my James questions. James got to be muted. If James ain't get muted, I'm cutting. I'm cutting out. I'm cutting Listen out. Listen to James, my. Don't James, don't please, mute please. it. Listen to my question. I've got I'm a second out. question for you. See. Listen. I want you as well to check out and to tell us in I, the side commentary later in the when the video is posted to come in and tell us what genes. What science work you are relying on for your claim that it was physically impossible for genes to have mutated that kind of a, a chimpanzee foot no. into Australopithecines? I'll want to see the technical. Are you going to let me answer the question? Okay. Okay. Are you going to let me okay. answer the question? You going to let me answer? Well, well, you understand? Have to answer, just, hold on for a second. Hold on. Do I, do I have to answer the question the way you want me to answer the question, or can I answer the question based on what I know? Oh, we we well uh, we see, don't know what you're saying. You, you you're trying to you see, you're, you're trying to control the conversation. R, RJ, can I can I jump in? He he brought something up. I want I want a clarification on. Yeah. Uh, if if I can jump in here, you, you brought up the uh, hip being crushed, correct? See, correct. Okay. Well, I was gonna get to that. All right. Well, mine mine was all right. I, I'll let you ask first. Right. Mine mine I had a uh, it, it kind of was more of a, a line of question that I, I'm familiar with, but if you want to take it, I'll let you take it frustrated. Well, yeah, because I had, um, I right now, I'm about genes. I'm, I just want to know with what we've found as far as skeletal remains of australopithecines, yeah. what indicates that they were not bipedal. That is all I wanted. I don't care about oh. genes. I don't want to get into discussion of genes. All I want to know is the bipedalism um, okay. or lack thereof in the Australopithecines, in which case then I will then say what I know on the subject and then and I Frustrated? Get, uh, you were kind of cutting out a bit there. Okay, I said that um, I heard what, he said. what I wanted to do was I, I just want to the um, from the skeletal structures that we found um I want to know what indicates the um, pedalism of Australopithecine. That's Australop what I want to know. And then after um, after that, Cap, if um, my question about the hip doesn't no, mine uh, was answer yours, then uh, I have mine. Mine was a different line of questioning on that, but yeah, because okay. it dealt with the reconstruction part. So okay. Um, yeah. So go ahead. Uh, see what is. Um, I just I don't care about genes. I just want to know from the um, bone structure what indicates the pedalism of the Australopithecines. Because he basically had a all-out monkey frame. The only thing that they thought who, was who, who, who did who did uh, Lucy, Lucy. The only thing no, Lucy. You, I I don't know what you just said. Yeah, go ahead. The only thing the only thing Australopithecines had was Lucy 
had was a questionable hip. That was it. Uh, uh, there was no hands. What fault. are you relying on for that? No, 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 no. no. JR, RJ, JR, RJ, let, let, let frustrated take this. I, I let, let frustrated take this one, RJ. Okay, I tell you what. No, no. I, I tell you what, let, Let's do it like this here. Tell me what human characteristics that Australopithecus had that we know for certain. Well, the I'm going to tell you all the care. I'm going to tell you all the characteristics of okay, the human ones. Yeah, tell me. So. Australopithecus, um, they did have a locking joint. It's not a human locking joint for the knee, but it was a locking joint that indicates bipedalism. Not only did they have the locking joint, but their feet weren't exactly 100% ape-like. They were close, uh, they were uh, getting closer towards human because you gotta realize that Australopithecine is a transition. It is uh, the transition between more ape-like to more human-like. So they didn't have a full-on human-esque foot, but they had a closer, uh, they had a transitional of what you would expect of a small change in a uh, transitional fossil. So then on top of that, uh, your problem with the hip was that the hip actually was found intact. They actually accidentally broke the hip and then reconstructed it because um because primates are um bisymmetrical meaning that one half of the body when you cut it long ways down the middle is the exact same ha uh same look as the other side they reconstructed it and realized uh, and put it back in place the where it should have been now there was, whenever they reconstructed it, made it look like it was a little displaced out, like a chimp chimpanzees would. But on quick analysis, once they actually looked at the hip, it showed that there was still pieces missing of it. So they had to uh, uh, form it back to where it was. And then, uh, yes, they did have longer arms, and they did have longer fingers to indicate more um more arboreal um lifestyle but right. one of the problems that the um of the um australopithecines was that the space in the uh palm is not there for um n actual knuckle walking and so you have a a creature that is not fully ape but not fully uh, human-esque at the same time. If I may, if I can okay. break oh, wait a for just a uh, second. Wow. wow, okay, go ahead. I, I wanted to address what he just said, oh, but go me, ahead. Yeah, let, 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 him let, yeah. Let, let him address that give, point. Let him address those points. Give me just a moment. Now, I, I've, got one, well, I've got one tiny thing to add. <clears throat> and it's your argument, your argument right. saying, works better if you go back to Artipithecus, who did actually have the separated toe. Uh, the separated big toe on both feet and was much more arboreal than our uh, than Aust and Australopithecus. Okay, so, okay so, so let me so let me address that. Getting closer. So let me address that. Basically, uh, Lucy, first of all, as far as okay, now I agree with you that the, the, the knee joint was something that seemed like it was a locking knee joint. Okay, but the thing about it is, you got this thing called variation. Don't cut me off, James, please. You got this thing called variation. You may have the, the knee joint was like slightly locking, but as far as the reconstruction of the, uh, the reconstruction of the hip, it was built on a uh, type of uh, framework for a human to look. To, and plus, that that hip was that hip was already crushed. Okay, uh, they didn't crush the hip. Oh, no, that hip was crushed, partner. It was crushed, and they turned they turned it to make it look that they that they made that on a human framework to look like it's human okay and 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 his his uh he was a uh, lucy was a knuckle walker he had the balls oh, in, wrong, the, in the wrong, wrist wrong 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 that's not false. true at all he had the ball who just did that Jane? we are in that that. is false i defy See, you to offer any source that claims that not are, even ruby are, are, are they uh, that's kind of, he's going kind of into where my line of reasoning. I can't, well, I'm going about to click off. I can't handle James. All right. Well, see, see. Let me, let me. Uh. Just can James uh, be muted? 
Um, I know this is installed, but it's not I haven't muted you. I just put a screen on things so we can see this paragraph. I'd like to know what you have to say. Do you dispute, uh, see, any of the claims that Sussman was claiming here about that it was both an arboreal climber and terrestrial biped? That was a source that Rupi directly cited and did not cite. What evidence do you present to claim that that statement is incorrect? Uh, oh, sh hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, wait, yeah. I thought my dog knocked things down. Um, okay, I, I don't have the source in front of me right now. I can't get the source in front of me right now. But I know that Lucy had a uh, the wrist uh, yeah, had a wrist that was made for uh um for um uh, knuckle walking. That's her, okay. that's what her wrist was, period. Her uh, wrist was uh, not what source it, it, it was, you get that. Hold on, for, hold on for a second. She did not have hold on, she had long. She had long monkey, uh, uh, chimp-like arms, and she had the hands weren't even found. They didn't even find the hands, but the bones in the wrist were for knuckle walking. Period. Okay, now since this was my line of uh, thing, though, real quick, see, you are going off of one specimen. We have found several specimens since Lucy, and we have a more complete structure. When you actually look at all of the specimens, we have a more complete structure of Australopithecines. And a lot of what you've just now said has been shown through the actual fossils to be incorrect. Um, as far as, yes, she did have uh, not only Lucy, but all the Australopithecines did have some um, ape-like qualities, including... Um, uh, being able to um, live in the trees and, and climb trees and whatnot. Um, but they aren't every bit of what you a lot of what you said is incorrect. As far as the wrist goes, the wrist is more like a human. It's not completely, but it's more humanesque like than uh, chimp like. Um, the fingers, I will grant you, are longer. For you know that do indicate being um, live for living in trees, but the palm itself does not have the indentation that you find in chimps and other um, tree dwellers for being able to walk on the knuckles. And these are all indications of transition. These are not indications of. Um, of just being a straight um, tree dweller. These are okay. all different things like that, that. That All these different little changes in the morphology actually okay. are... Before you answer, Steve, write that down as a third issue that you need to document in your commentary that you'll be putting into the video <laughs> later. That you'll need to document where you are getting your claim that Australopithecines were knuckle walkers. I'll want to see your source on that. Okay, I can't I can't write that down right now, but if you will if, if you will like um send me just just send me a message or whatever and I'll address that. Okay, the, the, oh, the, no, no, the no. Thing he wasn't here. see see he wasn't saying to do that um right now for a second. What he was saying was to do it later. Um, at a later date. Yeah, when you on comment on comment because you have been commenting video. on my videos all along, so you can put in sources on that. So let me let me retrieve on that one. If We've got one on the he chimpanzee said, the chimpanzee or, or form RJ. of Australia RJ, he said he said he'll do it. RJ, he said, do it. RJ, he said he'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. Um, but I was gonna uh, say if I can go on my my line of uh, of questioning here that I have for him. Mm -hmm. If um, all right. See, for, first off, I, I just want to make sure you know we're on the same page here. You said the hip was crushed, correct? And they reconstructed it, right? Yeah, because they said that uh, they believe a deer or something. Not a deer, but they 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 felt that something ran over it and crushed it okay um you do so let, let me ask you this if i take a since a car is fairly pretty much bisymmetrical i'll use that as an example here again it's only for an example if i go and i smash the front end of let's say a toyota corolla in could i reconstruct that toyota corolla accurately to what it originally was with no knowledge of what it was based off of what dimensions i have 
Uh, well, I mean, uh, when you're talking about a, a front end of a car versus trying to interpret what a hip looked like from something, hold on, all right, what a hip looked like from something that you're not even sure exactly what it looked like because of the fact is that you don't have the whole skeleton, you don't have the whole hip. You're making an interpretation. And the problem is, is they made an interpretation based on a, um, a human like, a human <laughs> hip first. Uh, 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 so it was based on a human for uh, uh, um, uh, standard uh, on how they interpreted that hip. Uh, they didn't base it on, on that. Okay. Well, well, they they another question. RJ, RJ, let Can me I break in here for a sec? Well, go ahead, Squirrel. I got a couple pieces of information for you. First, the, the first uh, reconstruction that proved to be faulty was actually based on an ape. And in fact, it, it was determined to be faulty because the two pieces of the pelvis would not have held together that way. Uh, also note that the, uh, where was that here a moment ago? Uh, the sacrum and the way the hip was actually, or, or pubic, her pubic arch was over 90 degrees and derived. It's similar to hum modern human females. Hmm. You have the sources on that. Go ahead and plug them into on. the... Um, I actually oh, watched right, another yeah. video. I actually watched a video where they, where they were talking to Love uh, Love Joy, and they showed that it, it, it was him showing how he did it. And when what he put the pieces together, I got a video. He put the pieces together, and it's an evolution video. He put the pieces mm -hmm. together, and it did not even fit right. Okay. Okay. Also, okay. also, hold on, hold on one second, hold on one second, gentlemen, because you guys just quizzing me about stuff. Once I put something, I put something in uh inside the little chat thing right there. What I put inside the chat thing was basically dog cr uh, craniums and skeletons. Okay, and this shows you that if I wanted to, if dogs was not extinct at this time, and if I wanted to show a relationship of ancestry, I could line up these skulls right here and basically say, well, this evolved from that, and that evolved from that. It's all interpretational. You can't okay. find bones. Hold on for a second. One second, gentlemen, please. I'm, you just I'm can't find to... bones and, and bone bears and then interpret them the way you want to interpret them. So you don't I... allow paleontology oh. to exist as a discipline? Uh, uh, if, you, if you have an evolutionary bias, no. No. If are you, you claiming that all... Are you claiming that systematics didn't exist until evolution? If you're trying... Listen. If you have a straight bias... First of all, let's be honest. Creationists have a bias. Evolutionists have a bias. That th mm -hmm. that's honest. Which okay. one pays attention to more of the data? More of the data come from cre uh, evolutionists. There's more evolutionists. Uh, no. Uh, more no, scientists no. Are, hold on for a second. More scientists. More scientists are evolutionists because if a scientist try to become a creationist. He will get blackballed. That isn't the no. question I asked. That is which, no, okay. No, no. All right, look. I really, I really hold on, y'all. I really want to say things because I am about to be in an area where I will cut out completely because okay, get your get your right, well, frustrated. frustrated. So, I I do have a couple points. Um, one, but address one, but I address these dog skulls though, real quick though. Address the dog. Okay, skulls. I will, I will. So you have dog skulls, correct? You have them uh, all different, all different, all different sizes, and are you looking at them? Going, well, I can't. I I'm on my tablet. I don't. I can't see what the thing. Is. All domestic dogs are related, aren't they? Yeah. Um. So what you're but going no to do is when you. Though. But yeah, listen, there is. Listen to me. Listen to me. So you have all these different skulls. Let's. I, I since I can't personally look at what you're uh, what you're showing. I'm just going oh, to I'll, say I'll that the, uh, you probably have something up, like right? you probably have something like a Chihuahua, uh, another smaller, uh, smaller but a little bit bigger dog and bigger dog and a Great Dane type of thing, um, and you have them all lined up side by side. And your question is, how can you tell with if if these were extinct before um, we Correct. gotten knowledge of them? How can you tell that they are different species? But the same, but um, but in the same family type of thing, right? Pretty much, yeah. Okay, so what you have is um, you we have we have examples of different dogs, even with that. If you don't have um, 
uh, Lupinus domes Domesticus. If you don't have them, you still have uh, Lupus, which is wolves. So, are you also saying that wolves um, in this scenario are also extinct? No, I'm saying, well, uh, no, I'm not saying wolves are extinct, but I I'm okay. saying, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so you have all these uh, different skulls, and uh, if you were to take a, an actual, uh, say, a uh, creationist worldview of looking at evolution, you would then say yes. You would say that in this scenario that they would be, uh, that they this would be a sign of transition. However, when you actually are taking a more secular approach at the data, not only do you have morphology, but you can also derive from... Uh, from the bones, you can derive just about anything and everything, come uh, even down to, um, in some cases, uh, the genes of these different animals. And you can actually figure out that through that alone, that these are sep these have different genes. Each of them do, um, all all the same as far as um, what kind of species they are, but different in the aspect that. They're not in the same uh, breed. So then you can sit there and say, but that's, but of course, that's not completely conclusive. You cannot, well, you can just say, oh, well, you know, just because they're transitioned, that's why there's difference. But then you have to go on all these other different fields of science that we have today that will sit there and look at every piece of information that they handle. Um, and they will sit there and actually be able to tell you, okay, no. Whereas one with uh, an untrained eye will look at this and say that these were transitional. These are actually different um, breeds of the same species. Uh, and that's I'm sorry. with all the different branches of science. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You are very incorrect, right there, partner. It's all we do it I, all I the time. On what? Hold on. Hold on. I have this. I Wow. I, I mean, wanna, let me, I let me get a question in on this dog example because this relates to a, a fundamental. Are you claiming that the wow. Collie, the St. Bernard, the Bull Terrier, the Chihuahua, the French Bulldog, the Pug, the German Shepherd, and the Bernese Mountain Dog are not all in the same genus and are physically related to one another by natural breeding? Uh, yeah, but uh, are you going to let me address what, the, the point I'm making, though? Yeah, what is your point? Okay, my point is this here. If you looked at, the, if you looked at these, okay, if, if you found these bones, what you can do is, this is what evolutionists would do. They would sit up there and look at these bones and be like, okay, this evolved into that, that evolved into that, no. that evolved. No. Hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on for a second. It's the same steps. You got, you got the same morphology there. It, it, the morphology is the same. You got the, the hot scenes. You're, 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 you're a you're at, conceit. Why are you arguing uh, this? Because no, every single one of no, those no, dogs I, did, in oh, fact, hold on. develop James, from James, James, you got, yes. James, James, you too, you, James, no. you too sensitive. James, you too hold sensitive. Hold on, see, see, this, okay, now see, this, this you're addressing it's me now. It's the same exact so, thing. It's I, same I exact agreed, thing. I agreed that uh, an untrained eye, even at someone who only deals in morphology, if they were to look at that just by morphological features alone, yes, they would... I conceded that they would do that. However, we have a bunch of different fields of science that does have better answers. Okay, hold so on. So if, hold on for a second. Hold if on morphology second. can't do it, then another branch of science will. Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. You, 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 okay, you can't use DNA because the DNA is not there. Okay. Uh, well, hold on for a second. DNA would be for dogs. Every time. Well, well, existing like, DNA. James, why did you do that? I'm a, James, what is wrong with you? Why did you have to not talking to you? Wrong with me? Because I've heard you spew oh, gibberish no. for okay. years, right. and I'm very right. frustrated. I'm so on. let's See, stick I'm, on to I'm this dog matter. Let me whoosh. Wait a minute. Hang. Shush. It's my show. Wait a minute. And I'm going to ask you a question, and I would no, like a question. He's gone. Are you he's claiming? Gone. He's gone, RJ. Any? Okay. Yeah. Is, does everyone see the dogs on the screen? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, okay, now that was the example that. he was referring to. It's a terrible example for him to bring up because, by definition, mm -hmm. every one of them, including get this size strike pug, there's the pug skull, <laughs> cute little pug, 
that they're all physically related. And, and you were quite right, uh, uh, atheists. You were getting into the issue of uh, the, the morphological details and how the skulls form and the genes that would produce particular genetic variations. And you would have to pay attention to all of that to work out the specific yeah. lineages mm -hmm. in the and natural that's selection. That's the problem is itself. because I, I, I even conceded to him saying that, yes, if you were to go off of morphology alone, yeah. just morphology, you would sit there and agree. Yes, these are, uh, this is evolution at work. However, there is a barrage of other science at work whenever yeah. we are determining the uh, relationships between animals. And this is extinct animals that we have this down to as science as well. We can still mm -hmm. get yeah. DNA out of bones. Yeah. Well, Dogs are really well worked out over the last 20 years. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Squirrel. If I may comment, uh, first off, uh, Lucy was was noted to have had a was noted to have had a human trait genetically and the myh 16 was actually was disrupted on uh, mm. and i got you two articles here uh one specifically on genital prolapse of for lucy uh wherein they took her pelvic girdle or a cast of her pelvic girdle and compared it to a bunch of human women um, yeah, I'll be checking later to make sure I got those in my bibliography on that. Is actually about is actually about her locomotor her locomotor setup, including uh, her hip and pelvic girdle. Well, the thing is, is what what I didn't get to get to is I can sit there and uh, can I can concede. Okay, let's just say that yes, that they uh, reconstructed Lucy's pelvis. And her um, and everything, and they got it wrong. Let's just say that they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Okay, that's Lucy. We do have complete hip structures of other Australopithecines that we can sit there and look at, and because we have complete hip structures of other Australopithecines, we can then say, let's just say that. Um, that Lucy's at the moment look like it should have been splayed out like a um, like a chimpanzee. The uh, other Australopithecines that we found will then show that no, that is wrong. That we actually have it wrong with the splayed out hip. That we need to um, yeah. that we need to make it more human. Actually, they I did not get to get to that. More human based on based on. Uh, uh, based on the fact that two parts of the pelvis yeah. would not have come together properly if the, if uh, in an ape-like configuration. Uh, yeah. On top of that, there was the whole thing with the Wait, pubic bone. Oh no, sorry, I'm just I'm just talking on uh, on the phone. I got you. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. And my line of questioning for him that I was wanting to get into was basically reconstruction. See, we know how hips are we know how hips work that's why i brought up the smashed in front end of a car right we can reconstruct that even without a knowledge of a toyota corolla we can reconstruct the front end of a toyota corolla based on our knowledge and i wanted to get into him when he brought i want to get into that because he wanted because then i was going to ask him of skull and facial reconstructions we do that all the time forensically. We find a skull buried somewhere. We're going to do a facial rebuild of it. And mm -hmm. that's pretty darn accurate. We don't know what the person's face looked like, but and we can rebuild it thing about based it on knowledge. Is that, and the best thing about it is that any, um, any member of um, the ape family, um, if you were to take the ape, and uh, because we're so asymmetrical, you can cut it right in half down the middle, and one because side is symmetrical. going to be the mirror. Oh, God. Yeah. Symmetrical. One side is going to be Yeah, exactly. That's why I brought up the car, because it was it, it was bisymmetrical. If you were to basically ignore the steering wheel, cut the car down the middle, you pretty much got the, the shell of it is bisymmetrical. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it's why... Bilaterally I, symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah, bilateral yeah. symmetrical. My bad. Yeah, like like we humans are, and that's what I was meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I wasn't the proper terms. Uh, it was the yeah, only I thing wasn't I getting it either. I still fucked up. Yeah, it was. Yeah. The only thing. That's what you have me for. Yeah, it was the only thing I could think of that was like that 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 we could agree on, of knowing. And then 
I'm just wondering, does he was he trying to argue that dogs, the, the domesticated dog, did not come from the wolf earlier? I mean, that's did, did anyone get that else that from him, or I, was he I just, don't think that's, that's what he was saying. What an example. Yeah, what, I mean, I, what I asked him was, I asked him, natural process is generated, and it's dogs. Because, well, the thing was, as I was getting at, was um, I asked him because he said that, um, say all dogs were extinct. Okay, well, if you say all dogs, you have to be more specific because if you mean um, the domesticated dogs, then you still have wolves. And if you mean all dogs ever, then you have to include wolves. So that's why I was asking him. I was like, I was like, when you say all dogs, uh, I was like, I I'm assuming that um, that the wolf is still around or in your scenario or is it extinct oh. as well? Well, the, the reason I was asking that is because I have run into one creationist, and I didn't know if he fell into this area or not, who argued that dogs did not evolve from wolves. I, I'm dead serious. I, 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 I yeah, understand that. So. I am dead serious. I just wanted, like I said, I was just wanting to see. It. I didn't think he went there, but I just wanted to be sure because I wasn't sure if he was making that point and argument of his like, well, if we just found these and didn't know about wolves type argument or if he actually literally believed dogs did not come from wolves because I have run into creationists like that. And that's why I want to know which side <laughs> where he was on that point. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's like extremely deep systematics from uh, a G man. And I am glad that people confirmed that it was in. Yeah, that was the person that I was thinking of G man. He's been like this all the way down the road uh, and he's very truculent and it, difficult. And he brings out the worst in me. I'm a calm and serene fellow. But, yeah. but if you can't discuss a very specific point and defend a specific claim that knuckle walking australopithecines is just nonsense and that the bipedal issue since the very sources that rupee relies on explicitly do not claim that australopithecines were not bipeds that this is a fascinating issue so he's got four questions up there i put i put them all up that he's going to need to bring up the source material on uh if, if any oh, makes any good. comments on the video cool. later on there will be the the issue that australopithecines are merely a chimpanzee and what can genes I does he claim said? can't mutate to produce the foot evolution the knuckle walker issue yeah. is number three uh, and scratch. then the hip reconstruction issue is number four we'll want to see some sources on that we can thrash over those maybe do those next week as a discussion if he comes yeah. up with sources and i will oh uh, he's not and in, oh, Joe, Joe Old not, says yeah, he's i was going to say he I, wasn't g-man g-man sounds much different so no that was on him oh, but he okay. uses the same Do style of arguments and tactics so yeah i was going to point that? out was and then he pointed out dogs came from wolves because wolves have a tremendous amount of variation okay let me I, now I'm, I'm looking this strictly at a design point of view Mm -hmm. What would be the point of putting that variation of all that variation into the genetic code when when you're designing stuff you want as little in there as possible? Well, you don't want to put all that, that because it's going to screw it up. Cap, that the more brings you up, have, the that more brings it up an up. excellent question: Is to what extent are primate variation any less broad as dogs? That would be another fifth question for um, yeah. uh, C. Brown to uh, represent, yeah. which is well, where what he thinks the range of natural variation is among primates and hominids. Okay, yeah. and my, my, my thing is, is um, whenever you have people who, um, who uh, sorry, somebody actually said something to me in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, it was uh, your new, you did good, and uh, someone said frustrated, dot, 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 dot <laughs> incorporated, and that oh, would you're, be Oh, you're an excellent form, handle. frustrated. I, I'm delighted. Yeah, well, one of my okay. biggest problems so, so is... C. Brown. Okay, sorry, sorry, frustrated, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, okay, I want to so check One of my biggest problems is that... Um, so, uh, he, he agrees, and just like everybody else, um, all the other creationists agree, Variations do happen within a species or kind or whatever you want to call it. Um, now, my question is, where does this this thing cap off at? Because, and I understand they say um, um, that it caps off at the point where they can no longer that uh, pretty much that they can no longer reproduce with each other. But that they can't go, they can't get to that point. But if you have small changes over small amounts of time and you add these things up because 
for instance, uh, t- take humans for instance. We are not exactly like our parents. We have certain characteristics of both sides, but we are not the exact clones of our parents. So yep. we do have a change in um, our morphology in just about anything of us. So as time goes on, each generation of children have different um, changes within them. So at one point in time, do those small changes when ha- when you when you keep adding them up over time, over vast amounts of time, does it cap off to where he says this can no longer be uh, considered um, variation? Because take for instance, you have um, you have um, Artie, then you have Australopithecine, which have a very small change between the two. Then you have Australopithecus Afri- uh, africanus that has a very small change between Afrensis and um, Artie, which yeah. I forgot the technical term of him. So then you have all these smaller changes in each generation of these uh, creatures that, uh, that, you know, you just have these small changes. And um, I'm pretty sure, like, you'll have um, Australia, uh you probably had, like, um, Afarensis and Artie mating together and still being able to kind of produce offspring. Then you have, you get to the point where you finally get to Homo. And Homo can now no longer reproduce with the Australopithecus, the Australopithecines. If I'm not mistaken, Actually, we would have. We, I don't think we could. When we shared the planet with uh, Neanderthal, mm-hmm. we were actually able to interbreed with them. And even yeah. if they were Neanderthal life, yeah. alive well, today, it wouldn't well, have. Yes, ne- no. Wasn't Neanderthal yeah. um, part of the Homo line? Uh huh. Yeah, very yeah. close. Yeah. Very close cousin. Uh, Homo uh, erectus yeah. uh, uh, Neanderthalensis. Was cousins. Hmm? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I so, Steve did uh, say something. But I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll let, I'll let you finish. Sorry. All I was saying was that um, at what point is that cap off? Because we have the entire Australopithecines and uh, even Artie, who uh, could probably interbreed with each other a little bit, but they and they have small changes over time, including the changes within their generations. With uh, within like you have uh, an entire thing of. Uh, of Afarensis, whose children keep getting smaller changes and smaller changes over time. And then you have um, the emergence of Africanus, who also has their children having these small changes over time. And then you have this point to where you go from the um, Australopithecine to the Homo. And um, at, and then to uh, I think I think if any if Homo could agree at all with Afro, uh, with Australopithecine it'd be the latest one I forgot which one in the lines it was but yeah. they could probably interbreed with them but then as time goes on you still have these ones that can't but at what point in time does these variations just stop even though all these creatures look remarkably similar in morphology. Yeah but are completely separate species yeah where does that cap off happen yeah and, and yeah, here I'll, uh, I'll put in a point that there's a, a larger issue here and that is that literally no anti-evolutionist ever thinks about that they never set out any criteria for how much variation is naturally allowed they're aware vaguely of the technical literature on very very precise little points but they don't really work out what the boundaries are so they will accept speciation perhaps but they don't then think what the dynamics of it are and so this is true for both young earth creationists and of intelligent design there's therefore literally no apologetics for c brown to work off of to come to that conclusion there's nothing for him to apply so instead it's a matter of parse it and slice it up till everything is separate and nothing means anything without ever working out what all they think they are. And that's what we get with Rupi and Sanford, where they have a boundary layer on one side, the Australopithecines, that they've got to push onto that chimpanzee side and make them not uh, anything human-y. And then 
the homo habilis and others which they arbitrarily push on the human side and that leaves a supposedly unfillable middle when all we've seen is stuff in the middle mm -hmm. yeah yeah and uh, a few things he, uh c brown has said in uh in um the chat i just want to address a couple of them one was lucy kind was not bipedal well, first off, kind in that. So according to him, a kind is a species. I'm glad we had that that worked out because Australopithecus afarensis was Lucy. So I'm glad we have it down to a species level. Thank you for clarifying that, C. Brown. Uh, next, you say primates have a tremendous amount of variation. So I'm assuming by that, since variation is, is the change, and that's what most anti-evolutionists like to point at evolution, we actually actually even with that statement there because we humans are primates we are primates by definition there's no getting around it we are and guess what chimps and other apes are primates so i am glad to see you finally accept human evolution there c brown glad to see that next you mentioned mutations being copy errors and how you evolve a tree swinging creature into a spaceship building human let me ask this, since you are really obsessed with dogs, let's look at dogs for a second. How do you go from a wolf, which you already agreed the modern dog has come from, the modern dog has come from a wolf. So how do you go from a wolf to a chihuahua? Mutations, whether and they be selected through artificial right. selection or natural selection. If you it have that as a mutation. How do you prevent a chimpanzee foot from turning into a human foot? What genes? What boundaries? I, that's one of the questions that we will have posed that we will be looking for uh, Brown's uh, comments on in his technical papers in there because I'd love and, to know. Nobody okay. has thought this through on the yeah. creationist and, 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 and for that one thing I know, deal. one thing I do know that a lot of creationists, and, and I believe that C. Brown will also say, um, is that there uh, that all uh, mutations are uh, no mutation is beneficial? We do have um, we do have benefit uh, mutations that are benefit. Like for instance, we have the um, Apo AI gene that was mutated into the Apo AIM gene from a small village in Italy, where uh, what happens is it is an a gene that. Um, has to do with um the cholesterol <coughs> and the buildup oh of, yeah, of yeah we're going to be citing that jackson and, and i are going to be citing that in the new book um, and okay. he uh, and uh, oh, this sorry, sorry, well sorry. no i'm not yeah i'm not done uh and this uh this mutation what it does is it makes it easier this uh mutation the apo aim which is what it's called is it makes it easier for the uh for um for the vessels to not have blockage. Then you also have the uh, mutation that it's in like 1% of North uh, Northern Europeans that makes them completely immune to oh. HIV. Mm. And it's a mutation on one of the genes in the human body. <clears throat> you have um, right. the fact that some women can actually have a uh, tetrochromatic uh, vision mm -hmm which means that they can see a wider variety of colors than normal people can and um which already women have a better uh, better vision when it comes to uh colors, colors. than men do because um part of it is due to the fact that um they have two x chromosomes while whereas which is where the uh color vision uh gene is on and we only have one Okay. So, uh, but these women will have um, tetrachromatic, which is kind of like the vision of turtles, where they see a vaster yeah. uh, array of colors. Yeah. If I may. Uh, okay, go ahead, Square. I have one thing to address, but here. go ahead. Uh, somebody said something, and the chat's currently berating him for it. We're berating him for it. Uh, he, when we were we were sitting here talking about mutations, he says not mutations, adaptations, adaption and variation within the genes. Variation within the genes would actually be something specific to the individual as would adapt as would general adaptation. 
genetically somebody that's genetically predisposed to a different environment than the one he's than the one he finds himself in um, would have some serious problems surviving to breeding age. However, comma if it shifts and his and that gene is still there, then it's going to spread. That's the way that that's the way that particular thing works, but it doesn't work on the individual level. It it does not and never did. Lamarck tried that and he failed miserably. Uh, giraffes mm-hmm. stretch their necks yeah, up. Yeah, evolution runs, runs off of variation. Not, yeah. not quite done here. Okay, if by some chance you get a mutation. Uh, that manages to wander into one or two or ten of your cells, that's still not going to get them down into the reproductive organs uh, for which the cells have a, for which the cells that generate that have existed since before the, since before the individual was born. And one thing he said, and I don't know if this is what he was trying to say, but I think it might have been. Uh, Via tuition, I have no clue what in the hell he's. I don't know. It's supposed to be variation or mutations there, but he's saying it's built in. Even if it's variations, again, I go back to my point of design. If it's mutations built in, then you have a faulty designer, and your design argument, from an intelligence at least, fails on its face right there because no no designer in their right mind would purposely put in I, a bad area. Yeah, once the again, word yeah. I think he was once trying to say was variation. Okay, well once then again, you're thinking like an engineer. Stop that. I, I'm sorry, that's what I'm trained as. Well, it, again, you're thinking of an you're thinking as an engineer, not as a, and not in terms of evolution as it as it really works. But if again, a, if you had a designer in the first place, yes, everything would be horrifying. Yeah, uh, uh, but but squirrel, the only Nature reason only I'm goes in that what works is C Brown is arguing. Best. Yeah, and, and squirrel. The only reason I went there is C Brown was arguing variation is built in, which again that would fail because he's talking about built in, and he's are obviously being a creation would have to agree God designed everything, or else he wouldn't be a creationist. And thus, I will argue it from a design point as an engineer because that's who I'm addressing. And that's why I was as frustrated. Uh, did did you, you become realize, more or yeah. less frustrated in the course of this discussion? Right. You know what, Cap? Uh, to be you honest, know what, you know what you missed there, Cap? I, 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 I realized after you said it. I, yeah, I am sorry. My oh, he he's got me in ramp mode. I'm sorry, and I and again, RJ, I'm sorry for that about five seven minute rant I went on earlier as well. That was that was on me. Okay, now hold on. Let me uh, address the question that was asked to me. Um, as a matter of fact, it has because you're looking. Okay, so as my uh, name suggests, you know, everyone knows I'm an atheist. Um, I'm one of those that I can't be swayed, but. It has to be with reliable, sufficient evidence. And the evidence that was presented today on um, C. Brown's behalf was things that I already know that are tremendously false. Yeah. Because I look at the evidence. I don't look at it from any kind of biased point of view because um, let's just face it. If there was indeed a heaven that was paradise to everyone, I would much rather have that as an afterlife than to just not exist. Yeah. I don't know of anyone who wouldn't. So I'm not looking at it from any kind of point of view whenever I look at evidence. I don't look at it from a um, evolutionary point of view. I don't look at it from a creation point of view. I just look at the straight facts. Yeah. If the facts say something, I will go with what the facts say. These are not, I, and I don't even ever say that, um, you know, oh, haha, checkmate uh, Christians or creationists whenever I present facts. I just say what they are. If they lead, if they lean more towards one way than the other, then so be it. So whenever he presented his case with um, Australopithecine, Knowing the facts that of what we know of Australopithecine, he failed miserably in my eyes. Um, and I'm not, um, this is not uh, me trying to gloat or anything. I'm just saying that from an honest point of view, it was a failure. 
Yeah, the, the claims about the knuckle uh, walking, the claims that it's just a chimpanzee, those are just empirically false. And yeah. what's so hilarious about it is that the very sources that were being cited by Rupi were saying exactly the opposite of what yeah. C was claiming uh, today. And so that I, I, I'll be fascinated to see what sources on it. I, he's been yeah. bringing up epigenetics. Uh, I, I think I have a section. I think I, it was in tip 1.5. It's either that or 1.7 on epigenetics which is how the design movement have tried to pin it. But there's a whole bunch of technical papers that I've been kind of keeping track of on that about the natural evolution and origin. And it was a, a mechanism, uh, epigenetics was developing as a, as a response to uh, parasitical genetic elements. And there's a bunch of technical literature on it. So uh, can yeah, I address just, something, RJ? Yeah. I, 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 first off, D. Brown, evolution is not a blind process unless blind you mean in the terms of there's no end goal then yes it's a blind process but it's done through natural selection through mutations and adaptation factors you've already accepted adaptation which is a fundamental part of evolution next and you mentioned I, the machinery of okay, yeah. frustrated no no go ahead because i was i was wanting someone to address that okay next you mentioned the machinery of the cell Please show me the machine parts in my cells. I would love to see them. Or are you referring to the parts that act similar to a machine? And please, oh, please go to the uh, flagellum. I would love you to do that because that is not machinery. And, we there, use are, and there are no designer trademarks on yeah. any of the cell machinery. And the machine argument that you're using is a very, very poor one. For one reason, it's called an analogy. That would be like trying to say Australopithecus afarensis is a freaking Toyota Corolla from my example earlier. You Well, no, no, not only that. Miserably. Not only that, but the simple fact is, is um, humans are pattern-seeking creatures. So, exactly. for instance, it's like looking at a cloud that's in the shape of a cat. Is that cloud then by necessity a cat? No. No. It looks like a cat. We are pattern seekers. So when we exactly. see something that behaves like things that we know to exist, then that's what we call them. Because yeah. the fact is that it looks like it. And, and we go off of that because guess what if i like like if if you if you said oh i see a really cool cloud i would ask you what does it look like and you go oh it looks like a cat then i will be trying to find something that resembles a cat same with the machine argument it makes communication easier to someone else when you're trying to explain it it, it this, yeah, this c brown has brought up uh oh I, uh oh oh yes yeah, someone has asked for a wrench i will be oh. happy to give you one yeah, uh, so I am, they can post some stuff. Yippee yeah, doodle, I, I, don't have have it, I am I am sorry for going full rant mode there well, today. Well, and, and he brings out the worst in me too. Uh, C. Brown uh, brought up about how evolution has has evolution accounted for the machinery in the cell. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a huge have. technical literature on this, and, and I know from following the design literature, which goes into this complaining all the time, they miss huge swaths of yeah. information. They oh, one of one of my favorite away. things. Oh. One of my favorite things about that is um, there was a study that was done where what they did was they uh, created a computer program with a simple shape, and what they did was giving the um, instructions of evolution and how it's done by natural selection. They then programmed it to be able to uh, uh, create its own shape over time. <laughs> and what would you know? but it actually went through the actual uh cycles that was predicted by abiogenesis and evolution yeah exactly and uh i mean rj can i can i do a shameless plug for a video of mine for uh c brown to sure. watch okay c brown on my channel and i will even say hi in the chat so you can even get to my channel much easier there, I just said hi in the chat. Here we go. Go to my channel. There is a video on my channel. You might dig a little bit for it, but it is on there and it's called Why Intelligent Design is Not Intelligent. I go through point of design that your God, your God 
would have to account for and why it fails and why creationism fails. I strongly suggest watching that video and educating yourself. I'm adding a, a, a wrench for a, a frustrated too. I'm yeah. slow as molasses oh, on these you. little things. Apologize. Uh, actually, I apologize see, on Brown, this. I, I think the waffle my menus to pop up with this many windows actually, open. Yeah, I will get you that video actually, see Brown? I will make it even easier and post it in the chat for you. <clears throat> yeah, the, the origins or bus thing uh, is uh, the, the easiest one that creation is just zipped through. Uh, on that, but it's it's again a delicious irrelevancy, and it's far removed from the data field. Uh, if they want to yeah. start bringing up design, then they need to explain why we have the ALUs we have in our genome, and are any exactly. of them designed? And if they aren't, then okay. why? How did they get there? What, All hold, of that. On, I, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sit down. I? Go ahead, buddy. May I? Yeah. See, Brown. The answer to your most recent question is chemistry. Basic chemistry. If you want to get that is the short answer. If you want the longer answer, I can give it. Please do. I wanted to get. So, I wanted to make sure I gave you the short answer. Because yes. Yes. So, so the way uh, that uh, proteins are created is through um, little things that we call amino acids. Amino acids are formed, and once they combine together, they create proteins. That is how they become. And this is all through the process of, like he said, chemistry. These occur naturally. Now, if you want to, you can actually go and look at the Miller-Urey experiment, where through natural processes of primordial Earth, they were able to reconstruct this. Now, the first attempt that they did produced a brown, frothy substance that was chock full of amino acids. But then they forgot to add in things, and when they added it in, it was a clear substance that had very few amino acids. But as uh, recent as the, uh, I want to say somewhere in the early 2000s, Jeffrey Botta, who was uh, Miller's um, undergraduate, if you will, revisited the uh, the, the oh, yeah, experiment. It's even more recent than that. I think it's around 2010 or so. Yeah. yeah. And so they revisited the uh, experiment where they... Um, where he found out that Miller and Yuri actually forgot a certain uh, a certain gas that would have been present, and when they added it in, they got a same uh, a same liquid that looked like the failed failed one of the that had very few amino acids, but when they put it under a microscope, it was chock full of them. So well, plus the analytical we have now. Prove. They even retested their old stuff and found there was a lot more in there than people understood at the time. Yeah, and so so you have these things where in natural occurrences, you can build, make amino acids. Now, um, one of the biggest things is people like to bring up is the fact that in order to make a single protein, you know, it would take so many years and years and years, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so when you have these uh, amino acids, when they go to combine together, if two amino acids don't combine, they don't automatically get scrapped and have to start all from over. They find another one that does combine with it. Then the next, the third amino acid will combine. If it doesn't combine, the one that had the two amino acids that had combined does not get done away with. It just finds other amino acids as it goes on until you finally get a structure. Now, if you have, if you go with, if you, uh, if you subscribe to the whole entire, um, uh, several pools of, of amino acids all over the earth type of uh, scenario, you have these pools that could be filled with anywhere between millions upon billions of amino acids over time, where they will eventually find their proper chain to be able to create the proteins. And while these, uh, while that one single chain that I've already mentioned is doing that, you have other amino acids that are doing the exact same thing. So all these amino acids are reacting with each other to then combine <coughs> to make several proteins. And to don't forget your little RNA. Make, They're all yes, catalytic. They can, mm -hmm. also, you make RNA I, that then makes DNA and it. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm almost done. So then you have RNA, if, uh, which is the uh, 
strongest um, theory so far is that you have RNA that then helps create DNA that then helps create everything on Earth. I am done. Yeah. Okay. Now, it's no coincidence that the inner core of the ribosome that puts a protein, uh, amino acids together to make proteins turned out to be an, an RNA molecule, not a protein itself. And that's yet another clue of what was going on way before the last universal common ancestor, uh, long before we get to synapsids and australopithecines. If I may add, if I may add a thing to add away. the explanation here, um, you also get, um, and just to give you an idea of how, how uh, of how easy it is to put this to put this sort of thing together, we have actually found coming at, coming in from rocks that have been that have, uh, that have either landed here or carbonaceous condites, or or been retrieved. In fact, in orbit, uh, we actually have um, amino acids in there and lots of other sorts of organic molecules of some extreme yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that just means is that even if you don't like the idea of the um, multiple pools of amino acids, you still have other means of amino acids arriving here yeah. and breeding. Yeah. And, well, it just and, means and, that all it really means is that chemistry is so easy to come up with that you can do that shit in hard vacuum. Yeah, it is yeah. no coincidence, <laughs> probably, that the amino acids that are most commonly used in proteins, because they're not all used in the same distribution, those ones are the easiest to prebiotically synthesize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and can, I, can I say one quick thing real quick on this topic? Sure. I know it's getting late. Yeah, um, we've, we've gone way past our hour here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. because I know he's probably going to try and bring it up, or he's probably thinking it right now, so I want to cut it off right at the knees before he even gets a chance to use it. Well, why don't we see it happening today? Because we if did. that shit happened, uh, but if it really did get to the point of evolution, like like to becoming a biogenesis again, if that happened, it would be devoured. It's, by it's life perfect. now. Yeah, you never, you never can get once. Once it gets going, that's in fact relevant to the whole issue of which came first, metabolism or replication. And I'm of the view, and there are quite a few. Uh, oh gosh, Andreas Wagner, I think, was one of those that went in on this. Um, that it's highly likely that metabolism has to occur. In other words, the thing that makes the raw materials that are knocking around there, that those processes had to have occurred prior to replicating organisms. Because the moment you have a self-replicator, it's going to eat itself out of house and home. And if you don't have a constant cycle of metabolites already in the mix, uh, you ain't going to have the replicator for long. Yeah, I, I know we're still finding amino acids. That's why I was bringing up if it ever formed a life, it would be devoured. I just yeah. wanted to get that point anyway, before we are trying to make that. Two and a half hours in, so I will actually have to pull this to a halt. This went delightfully into a bunch of different areas that we naturally went on. I hope we didn't bore the pajabbers out of everybody. I found some new papers to check out. We got some links in there. Some more people got wrenches. And thank you, Psy Strike. We got to see the skull of a pug dog right in there in the front of everything. So thank you, thank you, Cap, thank you, Croco, thank you, uh, Frustrated Atheist. Uh, we, uh, we're sorry to have added to your frustration this period Well, hopefully uh, it just, it, it's what happens whenever you cannot find um, sufficient evidence to support your yeah, claim. but I, 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 you were, you were enormously helpful. I'm glad you came into the room. You had excellent. You've done a lot of work on this area that I wasn't even aware of on that. So it, it was very, very directly helpful. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Also, if if if, uh, if our friend C in there is, if our friend C is still in the chat or still paying attention to this place, uh, you can go have a look at some of the stuff that I put in Creationist Canards. It's a short video series mm -hmm. on my channel. It's all in and there. And we'll be looking forward on his comments. He's got those four or five questions that he needs to deal with, that knuckle rock and australopithecines in particular. And I will be very interested to see uh, what technical citation work he offers in defense of those claims because yeah. they're going to be a tough haul for him. And one quick thank you I want to shout out to Sai again for from what it looked like there might be actually three books and the uh, running for the giveaway. So... 
So I thank you for helping <laughs> RJ out with that, with the books and the getting them. So. Uh, before I shut down, I'll just say uh, Jackson Weed and I are busy little beavers working on the Answers in Genesis criticism. Uh, the, our tentative working title is The Rocks Are Still There. And uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's going to look like it's going to be really quite an interesting material. I've got a whole stack of, of uh, Institute for Creation Research uh, acts and facts stuff that I'll be integrating a lot. That I'll want to integrate with the rate group. So that'll be up to speed. So we're going to be skewering a lot of crap uh, in this uh, new book. And hopefully it'll be on the par with Slam Dunk for something that can be added to everybody's shelves. And everybody, Slam Dunk! Get Slam Dunk! Okay, yeah. stopping the broadcast now. Thank you so much. I uh, hope this was a, a, an entertaining show. Uh, stay tuned for next week. We'll be waiting for C. Brown and Nephilim. You never came. You never came, lad. <laughs> <laughs>